Sergeant Bradley, you can start us off, please. Okay, sergeants, will you begin your recordings? Recording in progress. Computer recording is up. Recording to the cloud is rolling. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City How Council hearing on public housing. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or in silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we may begin. Uh, good afternoon. The Committee on Public Housing um, is set to commence. So good morning. I am Council Member Alexa Viles, Chair of the Committee on Public Housing. I want to thank you all for attending this important oversight hearing on the RAD Pact program at NYCHA. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my colleagues on the Public Housing Committee who have joined today. Council Member Ayala, Council Member Ose, Council Member Stevens, Council Member Barron, and Council Member Ressler. Thank you for joining us today. In 2018, NYCHA and then Mayor de Blasio announced the launch of a new development plan, NYCHA Next Gen 2.0, a revamp of its original 2015 plan, Next Gen. A major component of the plan, the Permanent Affordability Commitment Together, or PACT, is NYCHA's implementation of the Federal Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, known as RAD. PACT RAD involves converting 62,000 Section 9 units, or, uh, or traditional public housing, to Section 8 unit-based vouchers, with the goal of raising much needed capital to repair and renovate NYCHA's distress, distressed properties. It is beyond obvious that something needs to be done to fix NYCHA's crumbling infrastructure, but it is the committee's job to ensure that the goal is being met in a way that prioritizes the rights of NYCHA tenants above all else. There has clearly been mixed feedback about the PACT RAD program and there are still many questions about what privatizing NYCHA public housing actually means for residents. More than half a million New Yorkers call NYCHA home, and they have the right to live with dignity in safe, clean, affordable housing, and to know about the decisions that directly impact their lives. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that of all these plans, presentations, and decisions have actual impact on people's lives. It has been over three years since the launch of 2.0, and RAD has been operating for over 10 years. Since then, numerous concerns have been raised about the tenant experience in units converted under PACT. According to a recent Human Rights Watch report, the eviction rates in Ocean Bay, Bayside, and Betances were significantly higher post-conversion compared to the average eviction rates at NYCHA. Additionally, one of the main justifications for converting public housing units to packed units is that it will significantly improve the housing conditions at these developments. However, many tenants have also complained about subpar repair work and a lack of clarity over where to route complaints about shoddy repair work or improperly closed work orders. Packed tenants can no longer contact NYCHA to report conditions in their apartments and residents have reported difficulty in getting in touch with their new management compa companies and problems with 311. Tenants have also reported difficulties obtaining transfers to other NYCHA developments after conversion and have reported losing access to their social service providers since they are no longer NYCHA residents. With so many more units slated for conversion, these are issues that the community requires a great deal of additional clarity on. 
There's also a serious issue of transparency related to the conversions. Residents, elected officials, and other key stakeholders report little access to information on agreements, benchmarks, financing, and actual performance. In fact, to date, despite repeated requests, there has been no systematic assessment of the program. There have been no checks on resident satisfaction or other assessments of that nature. We have also no indication of how these contracts, if at all, um, are subject to Section 3, and if so, how they perform under that. Given the widely disparate feedback we've heard about pad racked, pad rad, rad, packed rad, excuse me, it is my expectation that we have a productive hearing today, especially to shed light on many of the points of confusion and contention around the program at developments that have already undergone conversion and to discuss how many of these problems can be addressed and avoided given the thousands of units slated for conversion in the near future. It seems, it seems that we are only interested in traditional market approaches, not investing in tenants and community control. We must turn a critical eye to ensure that the public investments in this program are in fact resulting in what we expect. Today, NYCHA will testify on what it is doing, but I must state for the record that the PowerPoint and the theory says one thing, and the news on the ground says another thing, and those are very difficult to console, and I, my expectation is that with this hearing, we can bring those two realities closer together and really interrogate what is happening here. We must bring sunlight and accountability to this program. With that, we want to start this hearing off by first um, hearing from the residents themselves, as is the tradition of this committee. But before we go to the residents, I will turn it over um, to my colleague, Ms. Sun. Thanks very, <clears throat> thanks very much. My name is Audrey Sun. I am the counsel to the City Council's Committee on Public Housing. Before we proceed, I would just like to remind those who are joining via Zoom that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. Uh, during the hearing, if council members joining via Zoom would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will limit council member questions to five minutes, including responses in the interest of time. <clears throat> uh, we will now move to Testimony from uh, the NYCHA residents who are present via Zoom. Uh, first, we will hear from Robert Camacho, followed by Miguel Acevedo. Hi, how are you? I am not a housing tenant. I am the chair of the community board in Bushwick, and I have been working uh, in regards to some of our tenants in the NYCHA uh, building on a hope garden. Uh, I don't know what kind of pack or what kind of RAD program you have that's supposed to be helping our, our people in our community, but obviously it's not working. In regards to jobs, they hiring people from other developments that they have and bringing them uh, to work there. In regards of maintenance and porter, supervision is the worst thing I ever saw in my life. The, the, the supervisor standing in his car, sitting there supervising, instead of going out there and checking to see if the buildings are being maintained and clean. In regards to the tenants in Section 8, terrible. Some of those apartments have, haven't even passed inspection, and they're still waiting. Uh, in regards to call for emergency, when does the tenant get to call for an emergency? If ain't nobody giving no numbers, and no nobody. In regards to the garbage, that's the even worse thing that NYCHA did, whoever did this. Uh, they got a private car to picking up garbage. Uh, money that's coming from their budget to lug garbage all over the development, so they're paying a private car to do that. Outside contractors, whenever the, ki uh, the porters don't come in, they hire temporary outside workers to kill the clean the building. They hire temporary workers instead of full-time workers to win that this community needs. In regards to downsizing the apartment, 
the way they treat our people and disrespect our people, by the time people wait for that, it is really disheartening. And I just don't understand how we allow this in 2022 when people need apartments and jobs are suffering now and under this COVID pandemic that they do that to our people, especially my people from Bushwick. I have lived here 61 years. I never saw such a thing like this in my life. And we've got to do better. We have to do better. We have to hold these people accountable. We got to make sure that these, our tenants get the service they did need, the clean buildings, to make sure that they listen to our TAs and our people. There is no one, no one are uh, being responsible for anything. They're passing the buck. They don't care, obviously. So I just want to thank you, uh, Madam Chair Ayala, because I know I have spoken to you and I have to uh, uh, indicate some of the concerns and issues that we have, and we need to do better for our people. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Camacho, for your testimony. Next, we will have uh, Mr. Miguel Acevedo. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak this afternoon and all the city council members who are present. I am telling you that I understand the concerns that Mr. Camacho is talking about. We haven't started the redevelopment as of yet. But I was part of a working group that was tenant-led. Many not-for-profits, including City Hall and NYCHA, were part of meetings that we held for close to two years to make sure that the tenants' voices were heard in supporting Rad Pack. In the beginning, there was a proposal to demolish buildings at Fulton Houses. Unfortunate, I mean, fortunate, it didn't happen because the tenants weren't going to let it happen. I respect the protests that took place. They had their right to protest against Rad Pack. Fortunate enough, we, in the end of the day, supported Rad Pack because we feel that the New York City Housing Authority is not doing anything to provide correct heat, to provide hot water, service our elevators. And if we continue to go managed by the New York City Housing Authority, I believe someday it's really going to be privatized and sold to private developers. So I believe in the partnership. I respect that NYCHA is giving opportunities to someone else to manage buildings that they can't manage, that needs to be taken care of today before there's no tomorrow for our tenants at Fulton Houses. I, like I said, I, I respect Mr. Camacho. I can't say anything about what's going to happen two years from now, but I truly have faith in the developer that we chose to come to Fulton Houses to bring us to live in conditions that human beings need to live. We should not be living the way we live. And as we all know, Washington has not provided any kind of money for decades. We're not talking two or three years. We're talking for maybe 40 years, maybe 30 years. There's no money coming to the New York City Housing Authority. So if there's no money coming, what do we do? when we wait to the elimination of public housing in New York City? No, I think the only way to go is through the Rat Pack conversion. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Mr. Acevedo. We appreciate your testimony. Okay, I guess, um, Okay, so we have two other public housing residents that are not quite on the line yet, so we are going to move forward with NYCHA's testimony um, at this moment. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll now move to testimony from the administration. Uh, today, the New York City Housing Authority is represented by Jonathan Gouveia, Sean Mavani, Simon Kowitzki, Leroy Williams, Brad Greenberg, Marissa Schaefer, Lamar Fenton, and Jillian Connell. Uh, I will now administer the oath. Um, I will call on each of you uh, in turn. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, 
before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. Jonathan Gravea? Yes. Sean Mavani? I do. Sorry, can you just say that into the microphone for the recording? Yes, I do. Thank you. Simon Kowitzki? I do. Leroy Williams? I do. Brad Greenberg? I do. Marissa Schaefer? I do. Lamar Fenton? Lamar Fenton? I do. Thank you. And Jillian Connell? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Madam Chair, members of the Committee on Public Housing, other distinguished members of City Council, NYCHA residents, and members of the public, good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Gavaya, NYCHA's Executive Vice President for Real Estate Development. Um, as noted, I am pleased to be joined by Sean Mavani, Chief Asset and Capital Management Officer, Simon Kowitzki, Vice President of Portfolio Planning, Brad Greenberg, Chief Compliance Officer, and Leroy Williams, Senior Director for Community Development, and as previously noted, other members of the NYCHA real estate team who are online. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss our efforts to stabilize a critical source of affordable housing in New York City, make investments that support resident health and prosperity, and engage more deeply with our communities in planning for the future. I'd also like to thank the residents who participated and who will participate in the panel later today. We have spent many hours meeting and planning with several of you to ensure that PACT investments meet the priorities of your community. And this program would not work without your dedication and support. In 2018, NYCHA committed to using the Permanent Affordability Commitment Together, or PAC program, to rehabilitate and preserve 62,000 apartments in our portfolio over 10 years. Through this program, NYCHA residents benefit directly from comprehensive repairs, professional property management, enhanced services and programming, and the abatement of environmental hazards like lead, asbestos, and mold. The PAC program also ensures that rent remains permanently affordable and residents have the same basic rights as they possess in the public housing program. PACT is NYCHA's best opportunity to deliver on our mission and the only tool the federal government has given our agency to provide NYCHA residents with the safe, high-quality homes they need and deserve. Particularly as our city emerges from a global pandemic, housing affordability and stability are critical to ensuring an equitable recovery. Last year, we provided the Public Housing Committee with an update on the changes we made to the PAC program, including the specific ways we are centering residents throughout the planning process and key resident protections in the program. And we highlighted how our PAC partner teams are completing repairs at developments across the city. To date, PACT has generated more than $3.4 billion in capital funding for comprehensive apartment renovations and building infrastructure improvements for over 15,000 households. Approximately $579 million in renovations have already been completed, and in the next few weeks, $714 million in capital pairs will be completed across 12 additional uh, developments in Brooklyn. Across the city, $2.1 billion in investments are underway or will begin this year and another 19,700 households are part of active projects in the process of resident engagement or pre-development. In total, NYCHA has more than 35,000 apartments completed, in construction, or in a stage of resident engagement or pre-development. As you can see on slide two of the presentation, we have active and completed projects across the entire city. Our work to partner with residents and improve their quality of life is truly having a positive impact. A longtime resident of Washington Heights Rehab recently wrote an op-ed praising the significant turnaround of her building and her family's living conditions, thanks to the PAC program. And the nonprofit Citizens Housing and Planning Council recently bestowed its Impact Award for Planning to the Chelsea Development's Resident Review Committee to recognize the resident's groundbreaking role in the PAC proposal review and partner selection process. I'd like to start off today by focusing on how repairs have had a positive impact on our residents. The next few slides highlight residents from Baychester and Twin Parks West, two developments that have received comprehensive repairs and transition to new management. The first photos are of Ms. Sandra Gross, the Resident Association President at Baychester. Ms. Gross shares that along with the repairs to her apartment, improvements to the development's grounds have provided all residents with a safe place to relax outside. You can see in the photos her new kitchen, the new on-site laundromat, and outdoor seating. The next set of photos on slide four are of Twin Parks West residents, Denny and Fernando Rojas. Through the PAC program, apartment upgrades like new flooring, 
bathroom renovations, new cabinets, and appliances make a huge impact in residents' day-to-day -day lives, making these homes modern, safe, and healthy for multiple generations. And lastly, I'll share images of Ms. Nesmith, who spoke about how responsive the new property management team has been. With additional resources for on-site property management, residents see improvements in repair time and in the day-to-day -day upkeep of the sites and grounds. Over the past year, our residents, staff, and partners have accomplished a lot, and we'd like to share some of the progress we've made together. As you know, many of our NYCHA residents have been living with unacceptable conditions in aging buildings with failing systems neglected by insufficient funding for a long time. They know the needs of their community best because they endure these conditions every day. Because of their deep understanding of both community and household needs, residents play a significant and active role in, planning, in the planning that happens at their development through the PAC program. To ensure that PAC investments address community goals and priorities, we created a planning process that is transparent and centers residents' expertise throughout. We want every meeting, workshop, and engagement activity to have a clear purpose and agenda. In this way, we are striving to make the best use of valuable but limited time that residents have to take out of their busy lives to plan with us. We invite resident leaders to participate in selecting the developers, general contractors, property managers, and social service providers who will renovate and maintain their developments. Resident leaders have had the opportunity to review proposals, interview development teams, and help us select the partners who are best suited to serve their communities. Photos of our meetings and workshops are on slide six. For example, resident review committees have led the partner selection process at Fulton Elliott Chelsea, Frederick Samuel Apartments, Edenwald and Reed Apartments, and Park Rock Consolidated. And we are currently working with resident review committees across 17 developments to select PAC partners. And later this spring and summer, an additional 28 developments will start resident review committee, the resident review committee process. With each project, we are learning how to support resident review committee process, and we implement lessons learned with each new round. Earlier, you were able to hear, and you will also hear from tenant leaders throughout the afternoon about their involvement in the, in the selection of PAC partners. We also have interviews and other videos highlighting this partnership with residents online. With these new demands on the time and expertise of resident leaders, we also want to ensure that they are prepared and supported. To do this, we launched an initiative called the PAC Resource Team, which pairs residents with trusted third-party advisors and consultants. The team is led by LISC NYC, Public Works Partners, Pratt Center, and Public Policy Lab. Resident leaders can select technical assistance providers based on their specific support needs and interests of residents at their development. Additionally, all households have access to free legal assistance through a packed hotline run by the Legal Aid Society. Residents can call the hotline and ask questions about the PAC program generally or discuss specific questions related to their PAC lease. We also recognize that information sharing and clear communication are key factors to successful engagement. We have printed materials, videos, and web resources to ensure that residents have the latest information about PACT and their development. We host information sessions about resident rights and protections, the rehabilitation process, and other program elements. All of this information is translated, available in multiple languages online, and delivered to all households in the PAC planning process. All meetings have live translation, and materials are posted online afterwards. Some examples of our materials are shared on slide eight. We've also returned to in-person meetings at many developments. We conduct tabling, office hours, open houses, workshops, and monthly meetings with resident associations to keep everyone informed and to answer their questions. Residents in the planning process also have the opportunity to tour completed PAC projects. During these tours, residents can see the end result up close. They can touch the tiles, they can see the quality of the finishes, and speak directly with residents with lived experience of the transition. Last year, our partners finished construction at Baychester Murphy and Batanzas, delivering 4,300 residents with over $261 million in critical capital repairs. In the coming months, partners will complete construction at Hope Gardens and our Brooklyn Bundle sites, completing $714 million in repairs across 3,900 apartments. The work completed at a development is comprehensive, meaning that our partners upgrade all aspects of the development. It is a HUD requirement that our selected partners uh, address the 20-year capital need in each building. As you can see in the photos on slide 10, repairs are made to building systems, such as elevators, boilers, roofs, windows, and facades, grounds, including landscaping, lighting, security, playgrounds, and public spaces, common areas, including lobbies, hallways, stairwells, and community spaces, and of course, resident apartments where kitchens, bathrooms, and flooring are all typically replaced, among other improvements. 
The next few slides show some of the recent work completed across the city. Slide 11 shows some exterior renovations made at Warren, Batanzas, Weeksville, and Baychester. Slide 12 shows examples of building system repairs to boilers, solar panel installation, and security improvements made to building entrances, among others. And slide 13 highlights some of the interior repairs and finishes inside apartments. Highlighted here are a number of different kitchen and bathroom finishes completed at Baychester, Warren, Samuel M. Hop, and Weeksville. PACT also addresses critical environmental health issues. PACT partners must conduct comprehensive investigations that identify environmental contamination and health hazards during pre-development. Based on the findings of those reviews, partners will be required to address environmental hazards, including the full abatement of lead-based paint in accordance with the 2019 agreement with HUD. Notably, full abatement of lead-based paint has begun this year at two early abatement sites identified in the HUD agreement, specifically Williamsburg and Harlem River Houses. And through PACT, we are, we are bringing additional resources into the community. NYCHA requires that PACT partners work with community-based nonprofits to deliver social services and community programming based on the needs of the specific community. Service providers are required to staff dedicated on-site social workers. As an example, the social service team at Batanzas Catholic Charities helped connect residents with several resources during the pandemic, including rent support, food, and even immigration support. This is just one example of how on-site case managers are able to provide direct support to households, and it highlights how the PAC program not only provides critical repairs to our buildings, but also supports our communities holistically by investing in resources and amenities that support resident health and prosperity. In the past few months, we transitioned eight developments through PAC to project-based Section 8 program. While the comprehensive repairs and construction work have just started at these developments and will take a couple of years to complete, residents benefit from new property management immediately. I'll highlight some of the immediate work that happened on-site at these developments. And some of the photos of that work are included in slide 15. At Williamsburg, on day one, the new management team picked up trash and cleaned all of the grounds. They also had an electrician, locksmith and heating contractor on site seven days a week to assist with timely repairs, and they repaired all existing lighting. The partner team has also closed 100% of the mold and leak work tickets transferred to them from NYCHA property management. And just last week, the first group of residents moved back into their fully renovated apartments while residents stayed in a temporary apartment on site. All lead was abated from their home and comprehensive repairs were completed. In just a matter of weeks, these households have new, have now have modern, safe, and most importantly, lead-free homes to live in. At Linden Penn Wortman, several repairs have been made to critical building systems, including the replacement of a failing hot water system at Penn Wortman. And repairs were made to an FDNY water line that had been out of service for two years, bringing fire protection back to three buildings. In just a few months, the new property management team closed 80% of all mold and leak work tickets that were transferred to them from NYCHA property management. At Harlem River, the team conducted a full sweep of the buildings and grounds, cleaning all common areas and removing a significant amount of trash. They also cleaned out the trash compactor on site, making it usable for residents. They now have development-wide cleanings happening every day. At Boulevard, the newly, highly, the newly hired facility manager grew up in the development and is familiar with the building's history and residential community. Under his direction, the facilities team is now providing emergency repairs to all elevators and boilers, along with a wide range of extermination services. While new PAC property managers are responsible for the day-to-day -day maintenance of our PAC sites, when a development transitions to project-based Section 8, it remains under public control and oversight. The real estate department directly manages the authority's program, supported by several other NYCHA departments, including community development and leased housing, which administers the HUD Section 8 subsidy. Essentially, NYCHA has contra contracted with our partners to complete repairs and provide daily maintenance that we are unable to conduct with such limited resources. NYCHA remains an active stakeholder after PAC con uh, conversions through a few different and significant roles. For example, NYCHA continues to own the land in the buildings that transition to project-based Section 8, and all apartments continue to be subsidized through HUD. Accordingly, NYCHA and HUD both have, regulatory, have a regulatory and oversight role. NYCHA is the Section 8 administrator for the entirety of the PAC program and controls the release of the HUD Section 8 subsidy. This means that NYCHA continues to certify household incomes and set the rents that can be charged to each household. Any vacant apartment must be leased to households off the NYCHA-administered Section 8 waitlist. And federal regulations require that Section 8 units meet the housing quality standards, which serves as a strong financial incentive for partners to address repair issues in a timely manner. 
Through our asset management and design construction team, NYCHA monitors conditions at each development and ensures that PAC partners adhere to their obligations to residents. The PAC projects are monitored through numerous reporting and tracking efforts, including monitoring the construction scope and progress of repairs, creating new strategies to prevent displacement, monitoring ongoing maintenance and repairs at the properties, job placement and training related to the Section 3 program, MWBE contracting, and monitoring the financial health and financial performance of each transaction. A newly created post-conversion unit, which is led by community development, conducts quarterly field visits with our resident leaders, on-site um, on community groups, the property management team, and the social service providers. And critically, because residents remain under NYCHA's oversight in the federal project-based Section 8 program, their rights and protections are preserved. Among others, listed on slide 17, residents are protected by these rights. Rent is calculated to be 30% of a household's income. Residents and authorized household members continue to have succession rights. Residents and resident associations continue to have the right to organize and receive funding. And residents can apply for jobs created by the program. These rights are codified in the HUD Rental Assistance Demonstration Program requirements and also through the PAC Section 8 lease, which we strengthened based on feedback from resident leaders and housing advocates. NYCHA requires that all PAC partners use the same PAC Section 8 lease and they cannot revise it without NYCHA's approval. Residents at all PAC sites are protected by these rights and our PAC partners are unable to change or remove them. While this program invests capital funding into the physical infrastructure of buildings, we are also making significant investments in people and our neighborhoods, and we can see the results. After years of planning and construction work, residents are able to live healthy, supported lives in homes that remain affordable for generations. The PAC program is NYCHA's only tool that allows us to make these investments, and we must make sure we get it right. We've learned a lot from our stakeholders about how to improve our planning, engagement, and rehabilitation processes, and we remain committed to ever improving our work by listening to our biggest stakeholders, our residents, and we understand there are additional opportunities for further improvement. We look forward to working with our residents, along with members of this committee and other stakeholders to continually improve PACT. We must continue working together as a community to succeed in our shared mission of strengthening and preserving this vital resource of affordable housing in New York City. Thank you for your support, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. I, I think before we move into the Q&A session, our two um, tenants are, are available to testify at the front, and then we will go back to Q&A. Um, so first, we are going to call on um, Maria Pacheco, and then followed by Ms. Coleman, who is here with us today. Okay. Hello? Am I a speaker? We, he we see you, Ms. Pacheco, whenever you're ready to start. Okay. Am I unmuted? No, we hear you. Okay. Okay. Well, my name is Maria Pacheco. I'm a member leader of Community um, Voices Heard, and I'm also the president of my tennis association at UPACA 6. I've been living in here in this uh, senior building for over 16 years. But I came from another NYCHA uh, building, which I moved in there in 1964. And so I'm a long uh, tenant of NYCHA buildings, so I've seen a lot of changes. Currently, my building is in the beginning of the uh, Rat Pack uh, program. I think it's very important for the city council to hear from NYCHA residents who are going through um, Pat Rack. Uh, Rat Pack uh, program, because there's a lot that we need to understand. We have a lot of questions and not a lot of answers from NYCHA. NYCHA needs to meet with residents in a group and also individually. The lack of these meetings has left residents feeling confused and scared. I'm hearing a lot of negative uh, comments from the residents in my building. Some people say that they're being pushed out. Others think that the rents are going to go up. They put materials on our doors that, and that's it. Residents don't need, don't read these. And they 
don't understand even if they did read it. So they're still confused. Niger also puts all the burden of sharing information on the tenant leaders. I have been asked to tell each resident about the plans for RAD, and this is too much for me to do. Niger told me that I could come and see some of the newly uh, rehab uh, units. When I asked how many tenants I could bring, they asked me that I could bring four. I had to run a lottery to, to get four people out of so many people in the building. And when I did told them about this, they said I can bring in nine, okay? So that's a nice resident to get the information. There are also significant uh, language barriers in my building. Residents speak Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and English. And they are not always interpreters. Starting this Monday, uh, we are gonna get someone in the building in the lobby area to answer question. This needs to happen more often in the nature in the nature developments. Employees ask, have asked me if I put up a notices about the walk-in hours. That should not be my responsibility. NYCHA should also schedule appointments with each resident so that they don't have to wait around to have their questions answered. Residents need more information about what would be happening in their building, and we also need to have a say. We are pushing to be at the round table to select the contractor. This is extremely important that all residents have a say in this, but we don't know if we will have a say. When I ask question about what will happen when people are moved from their apartments doing repairs and how that would work, I've been told that it's up to the contractors. That is not okay. NYCHA needs to take responsibility, especially because there are people with disabilities in my building. And I also have a few questions um, for NYCHA. Can NYCHA guarantee that the renting out units is not going to go up? Can NYCHA share a timeline of when work was started in our building? Can NYCHA set up individual appointments with each resident to make a plan for individual support to ensure that they have help packing and moving. What is NYCHA's plan to support seniors and people with disability during the renovation? What is NYCHA's plan to support residents who do not speak English to make sure that they fully understand what is happening in their homes? All materials and conversations need to be interpreted. City Council, we need to make sure that you to protect pre, uh, residents. Residents need all the information and support they can have, and they need to have this decision-making power about Rad Pack. Thank you for listening to me. We at CVH will watch, will be watching this program. Thank you so much, Ms. Pacheco. Next, we're going to hear from testimony from Ms. Sandria Coleman. Okay, um, greetings all. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I am Sandria I. Coleman. I'm a current resident of Isaac Houses, a former municipality employee. I supervise payroll for the NYPD. I am also a co-founder and uh, co-founder of the Holmes Isaacs Coalition. Uh, community board officer and member, as well as the co-host and co-founder of the One Night Your Pack podcast. The Rad Pack conversions has simply been a horrible experience for many residents. The Ocean Bay Apartments is a documented testament of the failures of the Rad Pack program in New York City. Last week, a plasterer that works for NYCHA approached me. Their complex recently went under the Rad conversion, Boulevard Houses. Their bathroom is in a unhealthy, hazardous state. I have footage. Her apartment was originally NYCHA's responsibility, but they passed it on. 
Just Fix NYC will be issuing a letter of complaint today to the management company on their behalf. That is just one individual story. Yet there are residents still living in hazardous conditions and experience chronic disrepairs after their developments were converted to red. <clears throat> Stakeholders of NYCHA deserve and demand healthy homes. The switch to red is not the solution. These changeovers are NYCHA's way of getting away with criminality. It is time that the city, state, and federal government flush in billions of dollars immediately to conser conserve our homes. We must save Section 9. Lastly, in 2015, when I and others was fighting the infill proposal at Holmes Towers, the ax was $2 billion to repair NYCHA. It is 2022. We need over $40 billion to preserve our homes. The willful neglect is criminal. The state of crisis we are experiencing is unimaginable, but it is our reality. Our government can spend billions of dollars on wars, yet when it comes to this country's public housing stock, true affordable housing, and the unhoused, our elected officials sit on their hands, blindfold their eyes, and plug their ears. Stop the privatization schemes. Stop allowing black and brown people to live in horrendous conditions. System systemic racism is what has us in this state, and it is time to purge those from government who view us as less than. NYCHA was declared a state of emergency in 2018, yet the crisis we are in has not been eradicated. It has exacerbated. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I will submit a written testimony um, uploaded later. Thank you. Thank you so much for your important words and contribution, Ms. Coleman. Before we go into the Q&A, um, where, where I'll start off, I'd like to offer an opportunity for Council Member Charles Barron to ask the first question and make a statement. Uh, thank you so much, uh, my uh, colleague. I think your opening statement was profound, and I think your opening statement really spoke to what the issues really are. And the last speaker, Ms. Coleman, I couldn't agree with you more. I want to support her statement wholeheartedly. Let me just tell you a few things. We have some beginning conversions in some districts in public housing in my district, a beginning conversion in a Boulevard and Penn Workman and Belmont Sutter and also uh, Linden. I'm a Wally Clay. My chief of staff has been working with them. But this is not the solution. It appears to be because, no question, the federal government denied, the state government denied, and now we have an opportunity. This is what I support. I support residency management of their own residents. Why can't we fund the residents, train the residents to manage and own their own places that they reside? We have a 100 billion dollar city capital budget. I think that instead of the 1.6 or 1.4 billion the mayor is given to PAC to do some repairs or whatever they're gonna do, we should put 10 to 20 billion into NYCHA and let the residents manage their own home. We went from section nine, which I support a thousand percent public to section eight. Don't be swayed by the cute pictures that they send up in a few apartments where they do these cheaply done fix-ups. These are major, major issues. So as we go forward, repairs have been done cheaply. Some repairs were closed without anything being done. Confusion over the process. Some people were told if they don't sign, they're going to be evicted. So they were threatened to sign, and they went from private, public to private. So we got to look at the difficulties and complaints going forward. And while these things go forward, we cannot take off the table the city council's responsibility, the state's responsibility to public housing. Rad and Pat, I agree with the previous speaker, is not the answer. However, when our tenants say that this is what they want to do because they have to live there, 
Omawali Clay, my chief of staff, is going to sit and work with them to make sure they're not getting old. As, as soon as they got in, we had a big heat problem in, in one of the developments. It was a, a real challenge, and they reneged on a lot of the commitments. Tenant groups are having difficulties accent, accessing their tenant association money to go forward. So when you look at all of these issues, and then as the council member said in her opening statement, it's not just these wonderful presentations with all of the pitches that we are going to go for. We're looking at substantive changes for a long length of time. After this year and the years down the road, we're going to see that this was not the right move, but I support my tenants. And when they want to do something, I'm just going to make sure that they're done right. But right now, I support this last speaker. We support Section 9. And I support a tenant management program where the residents will own, operate, and manage the places where they live. I thank you, uh, M Madam Chair, so much for allowing me to uh, make these statements because of the urgency that we have in our community that I have to attend to. But I, I thank you so much. And your opening statement was right on spot. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Councilman Barron. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, several other council members who have joined us today, Council Member Sanchez, Council Member Kagan, Council Member Salamanca, and Council Member Mealy, and, I, and Council Member Ressler, if I did not mention you before. Thank you. So I guess now we will move into um, additional uh, Q&A portion of the hearing, um, and I'd like to open up with uh, discussing financing and the deal structures, one of the places that feel most opaque to residents. Um, so I'd like to start with, uh, in terms of, in 2017, um, HUD calculated that the leverage ratio of funds generated for every $1 in public housing was $19 to one. After the conversion, of several PAC deals, is this leverage ratio accurate? And also, what is the leverage ratio for funds for private financial sources to NYCHA financial sources at PAC sites? <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Um, so HUD actually updated that study, and the latest number is $14.91 to a dollar, and that's for the HUD-wide portfolio. We do not yet have a number. We got your question last evening, um, so we're actually working on a NYCHA-specific number and do not have that. But for the program as a whole across the country, it is $14.91 as of the latest HUD update. And, and the latest HUD came out when? I believe in 20... 2021, something like that. So in terms of um, the leveraging ratio funds for private versus NYCHA, the, the ratio there for pack sites is that is that information I mean we have not we, have. we have not come up with an equivalent calculation for that um, but what I would say is uh, I'd go back to my testimony um, at this point we've converted the 15,000 units and that has unlocked 3.4 billion dollars worth of work for those 15,000 units how much money has the public sector invested well, um, at the end of the day, ultimately, the ability to raise capital, raise debt for these projects come from, comes from the commitment of the Section 8 subsidy. So the, the bulk of that is coming primarily from the federal subsidy that is in perpetuity, or in, in, that spans multiple decades as part of these deals. So that is definitely the biggest contributor. There's also developer equity that has contributed to these deals. Um, we have started to uh, use historic tax credits on a number of our projects and expect to use more of that going forward. Um, and we're continually looking for other sources of capital, whether that be debt or equity. Could we see a breakdown of um, how much money was, public money was invested in terms of tax credits, HDC bonds um, in these deals? Yes, we, can, we could date? create that for you and, and send it to you as well. Great. In terms of, um, as of today, how much money has the private sector invested in these deals? Um, 
I would turn it over to uh, Marissa Schaefer. I, again, we got some of these questions from you all this e last evening, and so we were working on generating some of these numbers. So, uh, Marissa, if you uh, could chime in on what we think our number is there. Sure. Um, so in terms of money invested from the private sector, as of today, approximately $90 million has been invested in from developer equity. In addition, uh, developers' deferment of their developer fees has totaled approximately $25 million. And then in addition, Jonathan mentioned um, historic tax credits as a source. Those are um, you know, federal and state tax incentives, but we are syndicated by private investors, and that's raised about $350 million. Um, and similarly, we, uh, you know, the program is supported by a series of uh, bond resolutions from HDC and the number of loans from HDC, um, which uh, private lenders and individual bondholders participate in it as well, and that totals over $2 billion. Thank you for that. Um, does NYCHA plan to publicly disclose all of the transactional documents that underline PAC deals? Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most common uh, concerns that we've heard from residents and other stakeholders, quite frankly, is the opacity of these financial transactions, um, both everything from what the companies actually look like to uh, what the agreements are. Can you tell me if NYCHA will um, publicly disclose these documents? We have all of our template documents online so people can see how these deals are generally structured. Um, as it relates to specific uh, agreements, we have not released those and thus far do not intend to. And the reason is because we want to be able to negotiate the best possible deals for every single project. If they're out there, then, you know, obviously, it makes it harder for us to do our jobs uh, in terms of negotiating with our counterparties. But for the deals that have already been done and completed, how, how does it hurt NYCHA to negotiate for? I mean, I think, well, we, it's a thing, something that we can talk about. I don't, at, again, at this point, we have not uh, contemplated releasing those deal documents. In terms of the sites that have been converted, how much revenue has NYCHA received from each site? Uh, I will defer to uh, Marissa, who is computing all of that uh, in, into the evening and this morning as well. Hi again. Um, to date, NYCHA has received approximately $275 million in revenue from the converted sites. That's composed of acquisition payments, developer fees, payments on NYCHA's uh, seller notes, and uh, a series of other payments, including rental payments and subsidy loan interest payments. Thank you for that. In terms of how, how those revenues are spent, um, what is the criteria that NYCHA uses to determine how it allocates those revenues? So the way in which we are allowed to spend money is subject to various regulations, HUD and otherwise. Um, so there is no one space that we use the money. Um, and it's basically subject to, uh, we generally apply it to NYCHA operations. But again, consistent with HUD rules and regulations. So HUD, HUD makes, determines criteria around you, where you allocate those revenues because it's coming from this specific right. deal. Correct. Okay. I'm just making sure I Correct. understand. Thank you. Um, in terms of, so is there any opportunity for residents to engage around where revenue allocations are made from these deals? Well, this is, um, you know, one of the benefits of, and we spoke about this yesterday, um, you know, we have been working to evolve our community engagement process, and now we spend a lot more time before we put out a procurement. Um, our residents are involved in telling us what they need in terms of their developments beyond the p &A, the physical needs assessment studies, beyond the engineering studies. They're really telling us very granularly what they need and what they want in the PACT uh, conversions. So as part of those conversations, uh, they get to, that's a great opportunity for them to tell us what they need. And then as we go through, as you, now know, as you know, we now have residents sitting on our developer selection committees. They can help us negotiate um, potential funding for, for you know, special uh, requests that they may have as it relates to their development. 
in in terms of I guess I, I definitely we're going to go back to um, this question around resident engagement and outcome, and it's I think important for the record to note that uh, much of what you described on the PowerPoint is our programs that are launching mm -hmm. as of now. And it is important to know for the record that a good deal of residents in the conversions of the, I forget how many thousands of units, right, the first tranche, did not receive the benefit of a supportive process that you are described that you were describing today in the PowerPoint. Is that accurate? It was and I will defer to Simon Kowitzki and Leroy Williams who lead our engagement processes. Uh, we've always been committed to engagement. Um, it is certainly much more robust and much more enhanced today and we have much more opportunities for residents to plug in. Um, but it has always been a part of our uh, program. But I would defer to Leroy and to Simon to comment on you know what we did at the very beginning. Uh, good afternoon. Would you like to, us to speak to those issues now, or do you want us to come back to? Um, the I'm going to ask process? one more financing question, okay. and then and then we can we can go back to that because that's certainly a larger. It would be a conversation. longer conversation. Sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, let's see. What is the anticipated profit margin for private developers and management companies over the life of the contract? Um, so the PAC partners generally uh, get a developer fee and, and a share of the cash flow. And um, in terms of the developer fee, uh, it's generally capped by HUD at about 10%. We've been negotiating lower than that. Um, and in terms of the cash flow, we generally spit between NYCHA and, and the PAC partner 50% in terms of cash flows. And is that something that's publicly disclosed on an annual basis? We do not. Is there any reason why it is not disclosed? We could certainly consider it. Can you provide to the council um, what those fees have been with, uh, for the past five years? Uh, it was embedded in the comments that Marissa made earlier when she was talking about the revenues. So that developer fees are part of uh, some of the fees that we have collected over the last several years. Um, Marissa, I don't know if you have developer fees specifically tabulated or summed. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, perhaps that's something we can provide in the breakdown of the funds that you requested. Um, particularly by, definitely, certainly by by company, and we have we see there are several um, repeat actors who are are obviously vying for for bundles of work. Um, it would be good to see what their cumulative uh, benefits and assets are um, in these conversions. Um, in terms of, uh, let's see. Excuse me. Okay, I think we. Do we know how much more private profit will be generated in conversions, um, particularly in infill? Is NYCHA anticipating um, using infill as another strategy? Absolutely, but in, you know, it would be done in, in concert with conversations with our residents. As you know, you know, we had this groundbreaking process with Fulton and Elliot Chelsea. And through that working group process, they agreed to include an infill project as part of that, uh, that whole, the bigger project that's combined with PACT. Um, so we expect that we would be doing more of those, but again, in, it would be done in conjunction with our conversations with our residents. In terms of you know, profits for, uh, for the development partners, I mean, it's hard to project uh, what that would look like. I mean, our goal right. is to raise funds to put into the developments first and foremost. And we're also making sure that we're negotiating the best deals. Um, we're not, we're, we, we fight a lot with our development partners around returns to, to them um, and make sure that they're getting, you know, obviously they have to be compensated. So there's a fair and reasonable rate that they should get. Um, but we, we are not looking to, you know, to go past that. We want to make sure that we're hitting that mark and making sure that we're generating funds that are going to go into the community. 
Thank you. In terms of, um, you know, I think one thing we are very clear at is the, the private the private market is certainly profit driven and um, connected to the what we hear from residents around shoddy repairs and lack of full services and no clarity around what is what are the benchmarks and agreements that are made for particular developments of these private companies if we don't, in fact, um, also have access to what the profit margins that are gonna clearly be driving uh, a level of service and work, it certainly puts the, the tenants at a disadvantage. So I think my, my comment here really is to underscore how critical it is to have public access to what the profit margins right. are here. Understood. Um, so um, thank you for that. In terms of, uh, obviously 40 billion plus, 20 billion every 10 years, or I'm sure I'm not classifying that quite correctly, but an enormous amount of resource in terms of capital needs. Um, we all know that the simplest and most direct way to preserve NYCHA uh, would be for Congress, obviously, to pass um, Build Back Better and to approve a budget that fully pays for NYCHA's um, capital needs. Would you also agree that the city should invest um, in NYCHA's cap, fully invest in NYCHA's capital needs? I mean, we are looking for capital from all levels of government, the city, the state, and the federal government, and we continually make the case um, and are hopeful that all levels will contribute significantly because it is obviously a necess necessary to preserve this housing stock in the city. Um, but in the interim, we don't have that, which is why we're advancing PACT. Do you think the city is um, sufficiently investing in the capital needs to address the crisis that we are facing? I mean, the city announced a pretty significant investment uh, a couple, of, a week or so ago, which we're very excited about. So that is a great start. Great start, but pretty far from the capital needs and the crisis at hand. Would you agree with that? Well, it's not 40 billion, but yes, we will continue to advocate for more. Thank you. In terms of, um, I think maybe I will I will shift a little bit to the um, to some basic rad pack sure. um, questions, and certainly we'll we'll get back to the community engagement aspect, which um, is very important for our residents in particular. Um, in terms of how developments are selected, uh, we ha I have a three-page long list of uh, developments in, in several phases. How are developments selected for RAD Impact? Um, could you talk to me specifically about that? Sure. So over the last couple of years, the strategy has evolved a bit to uh, address specific concerns. For example, in the very early days of the program, we wanted to make sure that we were uh, putting the unfunded sites, which Linden and Boulevard are among the last of the unfunded sites, put them through the PAC program because they have not had stable funding for decades. And this is now the first time that the so-called unfunded sites are now, you know, getting the robust funding and the repairs that they need. So now that, you know, that those types of developments have gone through the process, what we've worked to do is really come up with a methodology. And actually, Simon Kowitzki, who's the vice president of portfolio planning on my team, developed a methodology uh, to really prioritize the sites that we want to put in the PACT program. And there are a number of criteria, but the leading criteria are number one, the physical needs, the level of distress, right? The ones that are in the most precarious condition are the ones that need the the quickest attention, the soonest attention. Um, and secondly, uh, the sites that we have a hard time managing ourselves. Those are sites that we think are pretty good candidates for PACT. And then of course we have as has been discussed, as we've evolved our community engagement process, um, we work a lot with residents and we uh, get their support before we advance. But Simon, if you wanna chime in with a couple of more details, that would feel free. So in terms of, so my understanding is that in terms of the physical needs criteria that often uh, what is prioritized for Red Impact has certainly not been the most distressed properties, but probably mid-level properties. Is that true? I mean, they are definitely very distressed. Uh, whether they're the whole at the portfolio is distressed, yes. we can all agree <laughs> to that for sure. Yes. Uh, my question is, 
are do does the is there weighted consideration for more distressed properties or are we prioritizing uh, mid-level distressed properties? I would say the first screen is the most distressed, but again, Simon can add some of the nuance there. Um, yeah, sure. So actually a lot of the developments that are challenging for us to manage, like Jonathan mentioned, uh, also happen to be the most physically distressed and that's not a coincidence as you can imagine. Many of these developments, um, if you look at our, our pipeline, uh, are scattered across large neighborhoods and areas. They're really hard for NYCHA, this large institution, to really um, travel to these locations on a regular basis. Um, and they also don't fit our capital programs in the way that we want we want them to. You know, our bread and butter um, are really those larger campuses that we're all familiar with, uh, the towers in the park. Um, and part of what I've been doing is trying to realign our capital programs with the conditions uh, and the configuration of our developments to make sure that we're well suited for one. They're well suited for one another. Um, I'll also say that there are some developments that are in our pipeline that maybe don't top the list in terms of physical distress. Again, that is a, a subjective uh, topic. Uh, all of our properties are distressed. Everywhere you go, you see um, incredible, incredible issues that that need to be taken care of. Um, but there's another category of sites where. Uh, we do have opportunity to capitalize on real estate opportunities, and that's where the project of Fulton and Elliott Chelsea came from, uh, where we can actually tap into the real estate market, uh, raise revenue from redevelopment or the sale of air rights, for example, and use that funding to complement the funding that we can raise through PACT alone. Uh, and that is an opportunity that you know we don't want to pass up. It allows us to make uh, a higher level of investment in our properties. Uh, and again, all of that investment to be determined based on the needs uh, and consultations with residents. Thank you. I was waiting for that when that criteria was going to emerge because uh, it clearly is part of, of the equation. Um, sometimes a concerning part, but nevertheless uh, a piece. In terms of um, properties that that NYCHA has a hard time managing. It's a very broad category that one could argue, if you listen to the residents, are 100% of the NYCHA developments across the city. Can you clarify exactly what you mean by that, besides geographic distance? Sure. So. Aside from geographic distance, I think it would have to do with the nature of the buildings themselves. Uh, many people uh, who, don't, who aren't NYCHA residents maybe aren't familiar with the fact that NYCHA actually manages a lot of developments that were built before um, public housing was um, you know, first um, created across the country. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, NYCHA came to own a large number of properties that were taken in REM by the city. Um, these are pre-war buildings. Uh, there were also a number of buildings that were constructed in that era uh, which have similarly fallen into disrepair. And all of these properties uh, have a whole range of different issues uh, that some of our buildings that were constructed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s are not dealing with. Um, they need a really substantial level of investment. Uh, and those also happen to be those developments that are scattered across large areas. So from a geographic perspective, there's not a centralized management office. Uh, residents have to travel long distances to get to the management office and our property managers and staff have to travel long distances to get to those properties. Um, given the, the varied nature of those buildings, it's also not efficient from a capital perspective. So when we raise money to invest in NYCHA uh, on the capital project side, not through PACT, um, these are buildings that have a whole range of different roof types, different mechanical systems and boilers. Uh, many of them don't have elevators or other systems like that, and they all need special treatment. Um, and again, so that makes them difficult for us to invest in and plan for at a larger scale as well. Uh, thank you for the response. I'm, I'm not so sure I heard anything different other than what we always hear as the typical challenges, da daily challenges across the board, whether you're in um, Far Rockaway or uh, Central Manhattan. Um, I'm still struggling with, it, with, the, with this particular criteria, but we, we can certainly move on. In terms of um, 
the conversion process itself. Uh, before COVID-19, NYCHA and incoming PAC developers conducted outreach um, to PAC conversions. How were those outreach conversations conducted? So uh, I'll invite Leroy Williams, Senior Director of Community Development, to speak to how those earlier conversions were, were done. He was here uh, before me. I can also talk, we can both talk together about some of the changes that we've made to retool the process in recent years. Good afternoon. Oh, you got a question. Good afternoon. Sorry. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, so I came to around 2016 when we were halfway going through uh, Ocean Bay. Um, we didn't have really like dedicated staff to just do engagement for PAC developments. Um, so around August of 2016, um, community development um, was born so that we can um, spend time just concentrating on engagement with residents. Um, as of 2018, of course, um, we kind of relaunched the way that we were doing um, engagement and, you know, from the point of 2016 when I had maybe 18 staff members to do um, engagement, right now we're about 47 um, residents, to, um, excuse me, staff to do that. Um, we spend an enormous amount of time doing door knocking, um, you know, robocalls, calling residents, um, putting out information as a resident um, stated in the appropriate languages spoken at a development. Um, we um, do a lot of office hours. Um, something new that we are um, going to be starting in the beginning of June is having a dedicated staff person um, at the PAC location so that um, residents doesn't have to wait until um, we get to a you know, bi-monthly um, resident meeting so if they can just come downstairs, either in a, con a community um, room or in a um, management office, whatever is easier for them. So you know, the evolution of engagement is ongoing. Um, once a, we meet with a resident association, we try to curtail whatever the engagement process is with that particular development. Yes, we have you know, similar things that we do for everyone, um, but you know, depending on the site, um, just as Manhattanville is one of the sites that we've been working with, and the association president and the board really wanted more engagement for residents. So we made sure to do open houses in every single one of the buildings, um, in the lobbies, catching residents as they come in, inside of the um, preambulated rooms um, in the community center. So we try to hit whatever it is that most residents come to and make sure we send out that information ahead of time so residents can be available for those. Got it. In terms of um, the community engagement unit and the 47 staff, are they part of the larger um, NYCHA outreach or is this is specifically staff dedicated to PAC? So we do everything that has to do with real estate. So the affordable housing, any kind of infill um, sites, but we have a separate and apart resident engagement that handles everything else. Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, distinction. So in terms of the, um, can you describe the steps that you go through to inform residents around the conversion? Because it is one of the ones that is, you know, the one of the most common pieces of feedback is, I don't understand. I mean, you heard Ms. Uh, Camacho say very recently that she's very confused about this process, very uh, unclear about the documents that they're given, we know the city has a wonderful track record with providing documentation to residents that is incomprehensible, particularly on like technical elements such as this. Can you walk us through what the process is and what the documentation looks like? Uh, I can start and we can uh, get into some specifics together. So uh, actually, Heather, if you're listening, can you pull up slide uh, 20? Um, so this is some of the information that we went over yesterday during the, the pre-hearing call, but uh, you know, we do have a standard approach to conducting engagement that we do now across all of our projects, uh, and it's really consistent with uh, a common design thinking approach uh, in the very early stages. So starting on the left-hand side of this chart, you know, we're really just starting to engage, um, share information about the program, educate residents about um, it, about PACT and how it works. Uh, listening to them about their ideas and priorities, how we can best work with them to make sure that word is spreading around their community. 
uh, and address any other specific needs that they may have. Uh, in the design process, we're digging deeper and better understanding what specific types of investments do you want to see to achieve your goals and priorities. Um, this is also where we're selecting PAC partners. So uh, Ms. Pacheco um, from UPACA 6, who spoke earlier, uh, we've been working with very closely. Part of the struggle I think that we've been dealing with is in our push to start the engagement process very early and get out there soon. Uh, like way before we actually uh, engage with developers or even thinking about transitioning the property to just share information. Um, that is good because it now residents have, you know, that long launch pad before anything actually happens. They can start to really get familiar with the material. Um, but then again, uh, we are also hearing that residents as we all know, are struggling with daily issues in their homes. And one of the biggest concerns we actually hear is how soon you can start. Um, so uh, unfortunately, there is a little bit of that hurry up and wait kind of happening. Uh, but uh, we are trying to think about how to actually front load the procurement process a little bit sooner. Ms. Pacheco and UPACA um, are actually at the beginning of the procurement process now. So we're forming those resident review committees who are going to look at the proposals from our developers and contractors and property managers and work with us to actually select who those are. Um, once those partners are selected, so if we're still looking at the chart on the screen that's in the refine phase, that's when we roll up our sleeves and start developing those really detailed plans for their development. Um, residents at these developments now in the design phase will see much more regular communication from NYCHA and from our partners uh, because this is really where, uh, you know, we're making the pudding and we're getting to, to business and, and figuring out what exactly the plan is for this development. Uh, once it, the project actually transitions to project based Section 8, it's about a two-year period. And again, we're staying uh, closely involved in the developments and the work as it progresses um, on all different levels, but especially uh, with residents to make sure that all of their needs are being addressed. Um, I'll pass it off to Leroy to speak about some of the different activities that we undertake. Every phase of this work involves different uh, kind of uh, engagement tactics, and we've uh, developed a whole range of different tools to reach people at the big meeting level, the virtual meeting, uh, and on an individual and personal level as well. So as I said before, in 2016 when we started, we were really struggling, right? You know, we didn't have enough staff. We, you know, knew some things that we can do for engagement, but we didn't have all the answers. So of course, you know, as me, a long-standing public housing resident and working for the housing authority, of course I know we have to go to the residents because they're the experts, right? So over the years, we really built, you know, in a time when they can come from the beginning. Like, what is it that's needed for your particular development? Yes, we have these 10 things that we know that everybody knows a public meeting is needed, right? Everyone knows that, you know, it's great to have flyers all over the place, but what else can be done in your particular um, development? So, you know, just some things that we can um, um, notify you about is we set up a packed hotline and email. You know, some residents are, you know, don't want to particularly speak to someone all the time. They just might want it in black and white. So we have someone that's, um, you know, reviewing that daily and making sure to uh, contact them back if they leave messages on our packed hotlines. Um, we share information through robocalls. So if we're going out on a door knocking campaign, we make sure we send out a robocall to everyone to say, you know, you might see um, staff members walking around or whatever it is. If they're not going to your door, this is to share information about the program that's coming to you. We also use robocalls for announcing meetings and for, you know, people the day before just to make sure they remember that the meeting is happening. We do meetings, of course, now with COVID, we do it virtually and in person. Um, for the last two years, we um, was just doing um, virtual, but um, recently we started doing in-person meetings. And just up last week, we had a in-person meeting at Manhattanville Houses uh, on de design and construction. Um, we give monthly um, resident association board updates. Um, sometimes they are, you know, depending on the association, sometimes they're busier than others, but we try to make sure we meet with them regularly to give them updates and as any resident association, if they have questions and things like that or need clarity, we want to make sure to give them that clarity on an ongoing basis. Um, open houses was something probably after 2018 that we started. Um, basically, we're offering an allotment of three to four hours where my staff is either in the lobbies or in a community center or a senior center so that all residents are aware they can come downstairs and ask those um, questions 
everybody doesn't want to talk in a big meeting. Um, so we want to give you know, people individual um, time to ask those questions and receive information. Um, we give PAC tours to um, developments where um, they completed construction. Um, as of now, um, we have 30 schedules in the next couple of months. Um, we do two to three per week. Um, you know, we try to get as many um, residents as possible, but of course, sometimes, as Ms. Pacheco pointed out, you know, we can't have tons and tons and tons at one time. So what we do is try to break it down, come back, they can bring more people, and we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to see it. So we will be reaching out you know, to her and to other resident associations to say, these when we can have it on Saturdays, you know, during the evening time, during the daytime. So we try to spread um, you know, the timing for those tours. We also, as I believe um, Jonathan pointed out, legal services. So we have a partnership with Legal Aid where they set up a hotline. So we try to share, up that, share that information with residents from the beginning. Um, to make sure that, you know, if they have questions and, you know, they might say, okay, well, Leroy said X, Y, and Z, and Simon, do I believe them? If they're sharing information with us, do, you know, we need clarity on them. So if they don't want to go to us, they have a legal service that's prepared and ready to go. Leroy, can I ask, what is the, what is the budget for the resident engagement? And is there a budget specifically for interpretation and translation yes. of documentation? So I have a budget close to $200,000 that's given to me from the beginning. And then as needed, uh, our real estate partners um, put in additional um, funding. Um, but for everything that we do, we try to make sure that whatever language is spoken at that particular development is there. So in every meeting, we always have a translator. Um, you know, if things come up that we weren't aware of particular um, languages there, we try to make sure we'll uh, follow up with that resident um, NYCHA has its own language bank, um, so when we do canvassing, of course, I can't have 10 <laughs> different um, canvassers that speak the language, but what we do is we have a language card. The resident is able to um, pick what language on there that they speak, and we can actually call that language bank on the spot to help us interpret what we're trying to say in response to um, our questions or answers. So in terms, of the, in terms of the OTPS for outside of the, the personnel staff, yes, I it's $200,000 uh, what you have to do interpretation and anything else that the yeah, unit might need in terms of Because our real estate partners give money for like AV and you know, other things. So I uh, concentrate my funding on particular things and then the rest of the funding comes from um, real estate. And, and how is that determined? No, I'll just say that the NYCHA budget is actually most utilized in the early planning stage. So as Leroy mentioned, once the PAC partners are selected and come on board, you know, they're the ones that uh, are actually then providing the AV and the facilities and the translators. So, um, you know, depending on your perspective, it may not sound like right. enough, but it's used for probably the first half of the process for each project. So with the, with the current ramping up, that we see and all the units that are slated for conversion, is the expectation that a $200,000 budget is gonna be sufficient for those numbers of conversions so coming again, up? So again, my um, budget concentrates on certain things, right? So right. the tours, I pay for that type of thing. The, um, some of the language services, I pay for that type of thing. So there's things that real estate pays for, right? So um, audio and visual, and you know, sound and things like that that we need for our meetings, we use their budget for that. And then for our budget, it's more as a smaller type of things. I mean, it's all in quotes, right, smaller, but um, we try to, um, I don't usually go over my um, $200,000 because a lot of the big ticket items come out of the budget of real estate. Right, we'd love to see a copy of what the community engagement budget uh, for, the, for this unit is with, with kind of the itemized breakdown around Translation services and other aspects of the activities that you plan there. No Thank problem. Thank you. Um, I have eight million more questions, but I would like to open it up to my colleagues who are eagerly waiting and have uh, comments and questions. So it's Audrey. Thanks very much. Um, we'll now take questions from council members who've raised their hands via Zoom. First, we'll hear from council member Stevens, followed by uh, council member Ayala, and then council member Ressler. 
the time will begin. Oh, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, I would first like to give a special shout out to Council Member Viles, who is doing an amazing job with this hearing. And I'm so grateful that you are the chair of this committee. Um, you're doing amazing work. And the questions you're asking are questions we need to hear. And you're doing it with so much love and compassion. So I just wanted to give you a special shout out for that. Um, so I have a couple of questions and I'll use my time very wisely. So I'll ask um, two of them in conjunction, you can answer and then I'll see if I have more time. So my first question is how has NYCHA um, conducted an overall assessment of the 14 plus units that have already been converted with RAD? Um, and if you've done an assessment, could you please uh, give us a breakdown of what that is? And then has, what is NYCHA's process for evaluating developers and the process for removing developers who have chronic violations and complaints. So on the first, as it relates to assessments, we haven't done assessments per se. Um, we are in the process of designing and rolling out um, a series of surveys that we would put out to residents to do exactly that, um, to really gauge uh, their satisfaction with different aspects of the whole program, really. So from the beginning, the engagement, through, is there, through, I'm sorry not to cut you off, but is there a specific reason why you haven't done an assessment, like a real evaluation and not just a survey? Um, we are, as I've said through the testimony, I mean, we're always looking to improving the program. Um, it is something that we realized was a weakness, and that's why we're doing it now. I just want to point out a survey is not an assessment, and that's not a real evaluation. So I think that um, we should really be thinking about how are we assessing things before we are expanding them. Um, before we get into a place where we can't really roll right. things back. So I think that it's important that we take time to do an actual 360 assessment and talk to not just residents, we talk to, you know, the developers and get real accurate data that can be, that can be used to have real assessments. So I think that that's a, a flaw that we have there already. So um, well, can we also... Um, so just mm -hmm. the, the surveys that I mentioned, though, are one piece that we're working on. One thing that we established over a year ago was an asset management team and a design and construction team, and both of those teams are actually collecting a lot of reporting on a monthly basis. Um, and so that we are collecting reports as it relates to the performance of the, de of the construction, making sure that it's being, uh, the construction projects are happening according to expectations. Um, and we have regular spot checks, both NYCHA folks going out, and we have uh, a third party that we've hired to also do that validation for us. Um, in addition, our asset management team collects monthly reporting on a whole host of issues from um, uh, work order performance, making sure, especially with a, with a keen focus on the, the sort of... So how is that data then um, put together and then dispersed to residents and, you know, elected officials? Because that sounds like a lot of reports, so then where is that being put together and, like, sent out so it can be seen and made available to the public? We have not released those yet. Um, we have been building this out over the past year and getting a database and, and working that out. But our expectation is that we would be developing dashboards and sharing that information more widely. Well, I, I think that that should definitely be a priority because I think that's some of the issues and concerns that we're hearing from residents where they're not feeling like they're getting the adequate, um, adequate information. And then also just making sure that it is, you know, uh, something that people can digest because um, chairperson had, she explained how a lot of times information that is given to residents and to the public isn't really digestible and hard to understand and hard to navigate. So we should definitely make sure that it's, you know, people can understand what you're putting out. But my next question was, what is the process for evaluating developers? And what is the process for moving developers that have chronic violations and complaints? So uh, we go through a, currently we go through a two-step process as it relates to PAC procurements. The first, uh, which we do at the beginning of every year, is an RFQ, a request for qualifications. Um, and that is put out to developers, general contractors, um, property managers, and we're looking uh, for them to submit their credentials, essentially. Um, and we, we, we go through and we approve everybody, uh, assuming that they meet our thresholds, um, on an annual basis. And anyone who was qualified in any given year isn't necessarily rolled over. They have to sort of restate uh, their interest in going forward in an additional year. So it's not just this automatic rollover. Um, and and then, what, what, what part does the residents play in that? Um, well, we're looking at making some changes. I'll, I'll just finish describing what we currently do. 
Um, so what we do once we've pre-qualified folks in the early part of the year, usually January, February, as we go through the calendar year and we then focus on specific sites, we will invite uh, packed teams to submit proposals uh, specific to sites. And as you've heard, what we've started doing in the last year or so is having resident review committees, and they sit on those committees uh, and interview the respondents. So they see the proposals, they get to analyze the proposals, and then they get to interview the respondents, and they ultimately make the decision as to which team they feel most comfortable with. We are looking at, to your question, how do we front load uh, some of that work? How do we get the, the residents involved even in the early stage of the pre-qualification pre pre stage? Um, at this point, that is something that we do in-house, but we are looking to, you know, again, bring the residents in earlier. Um, um, Councilmember no, Stevens, so Council Member Stevens, yeah. I just want to to jump in on this point in terms of the RFQ and that process. Um, could you, could Nitro provide us with the RFQ and yes, also, we, can share those documents. Um, we want resident engagement, not just after RFQs are done, but constructing RFQs. Because we know that residents are incredibly savvy at the things, at spotting those things that they need. Um, and so I would like to see residents much earlier in on that process, but on design and decision making. We agree. Um, please, Council Member Stevens, continue. Thank you so much. I just, I had a, another, I guess, question slash statement because I know we just talked a little bit about the community, I mean, the resident engagement piece. And I was just literally at one of my developments where um, I had a lot of residents telling me that they're being, tra um, you know, the, they're in the process of becoming a rad and all these things. But they were just very confused and then the CBO said that they offered up space to NYCHA to hold the meeting um, but then no one from NYCHA ever got back to them so I just want to say it sounds like there's a plan that's in place but I'm not really sure how that plan is actually being implemented because there's still a lot of residents who are unclear about um, this process when things are going to be turned over and so it's nice that you know in the beginning you guys had all these great pictures up but it's still very scary for residents who are living through this process and we need to make sure that we're including them and making sure that they understand the process. And I think that that's what this pushback is about because no one is understanding when, when there's, and when it's not clear and where there's smoke, there's fire here. So for me, we need to make sure the residents are included at every aspect. And um, I think that is really important and we owe them that because we've been, we for so long have not given them the respect that they deserve. So thank you, Chair Aviles. We appreciate what you're doing and I'm here to support you and I'll give the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Ayala. Um, if uh, if Council Member Ayala is not. Um, Present, we'll take questions from Council Member Ressler. I'm here. Oh, Hello. Oh. Sorry, somebody needed to unmute me. Uh, hey, Victor, I see you smiling there. <laughs> you saw me waving. Um, um, but my question is really around the selection process. I, I, I'd like to understand how a development is selected to be transitioned uh, to PACT and RAD. I'm hearing you know, conflicting reports on the ground from resident leaders about what that process looks like, and that, that concerns me. Um, I've heard from some members that, from some resident leaders that they have received informal visits from NYCHA staff, they've had conversations about you know, the possibility of transitioning, what transitioning means, and if they've expressed any interest whatsoever or are curious about you know, the possibility that they have automatically been, you know, uh, put on the list. And so that that obviously concerns me. Um, so that's question number one. And question number two is that um, several of my senior buildings are being transitioned. And I am concerned about the developer's capacity uh, to deal with, you know, an experience with the older adult population. Um, we, you know, seen uh, the nightmare that has 
resulted in NYCHA building, senior buildings, and leaving them, you know, uh, without the necessary resources of social service workers, 24-hour security. Um, and so I, I, I'd really like to know what that, you know, if, if there's any difference in the way that we're going to be addressing the senior housing portfolio um, as opposed to the, the, uh, the rest of the, the, the building. Thank you. So on the first part about this selection, um, it is quite possible that you're hearing conflicting things about the resident involvement in the developer selection. And that's a product of just the evolution of how we've been doing things. I know Batanzas, for example, is in your district. Uh, that development uh, went through PACT and residents were not involved because it was one of the earlier projects. Um, so residents at that development who may hear about this will say, well, that never happened with us and that would be true. Um, based on feedback and based on experience, we have added this. So I would say, you know, where there is conflict, it is likely due to just the age of a project. So earlier ones, we did not do that. Newer projects, we've been endeavoring to do that. That's not, that's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the recent um, uh, developments that were transitioned over. Um, first, you know, I, I think in the, in the East Harlem part of the district, I have four uh, developments that were being that were transitioning, and I was the last to know. Um, I actually found out through one of my resident leaders, um, which to me is problematic, by the way. Um, and you know, then there were some others in the Bronx that were transitioned, and you know, and I was curious to find out well, how, why were these buildings selected as opposed to others? You know, just out of curiosity, and um, and some of the resident leaders, uh, you know, uh, said to me, well, so and so, and I don't want to name names, you know, and I, you know. It's, came over and was talking to us about this program. Um, and the next thing I know, I ended up on this list. And it became apparent that if anybody expressed any level of you know, excitement or curiosity about the program, and, and that's obviously not a way to um, you know, interact with uh, the leaders. I think there has to be transparency. And there has to, you know, so I think that it wasn't clear to them that they were passively agreeing to being, you know, uh, transitioned over. And, and that's a problem. So, you know, I, I'm not even going to make it a question. I'll just leave it at that as a statement. I think that that is a problem for me. That is a problem for my, you know, for my leaders. And this just happened a couple of months ago. I did speak to NYCHA about this, um, and, I, and I have expressed my concern. So um, I'll leave it at that. But if you can um, respond to the question around the senior buildings, um, I greatly appreciate that. And um, sure. can I also have I also so, have a question, I'm sorry, on uh, the number of, I, I was wondering if you happen to have the number of units that are currently offline because of the uh, extensive need of repair. So just back on your first issue, um, I would offer to set up time for you to go through all of the developments because I want to make sure that it's clear to you and to other members of your community. So I would offer to do that and we can schedule that separately. Um, as it relates to the seniors um, buildings, again, I think we'd want to work with you because this is obviously critically important. We want to make sure, I mean, again, as I said in my testimony, for us it's not just about repairing the buildings. We want to make sure that we're investing in these communities holistically. So we want to make sure that we are providing the services to the residents of the buildings and we understand that each building is its own community. Um, so there is no cookie cutter approach. So we would be happy to work with you and resident leaders to make sure that those senior developments um, you know, get the kind of attention that they need so that those are successful projects if they should materialize. And then, sorry, what was the, the third comment there? No, I, in regards to the senior buildings, how are you, you know, what's different in the transition process for the senior buildings? Because seniors require a different level of, of service. So I, I'm curious to know if there's any difference. Um, well, primarily I would be, right off the top of my head, I would say we would look for uh, a robust social services program. So we would want to make sure that the social services provider uh, has deep experience in, in serving uh, senior citizens. Again, we can talk with you and other folks um, to find out if there is more uh, that we can do to, to make sure that, this, that we are serving those residents appropriately. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate that. I, I did ask a question. Maybe you can go back to me later with that. I would, I would love to know what the number of units that are currently offline is. Um, due to extensive repair uh, work that's needed. So if somebody could send that over, I'd greatly appreciate it. Yeah, we'll have to get back to you on that number. Thank you. 
I'm sorry, Jonathan, did you mention, um, actually, I don't know if I asked specifically, um, in terms of this selection process and, and the, the list moving forward, can you provide to the council what, again, what this rubric is? We, we, run, we ran through some kind of broad strokes criteria, but uh, we'd love to see a comprehensive document of both the rubric and then how, how the units stacked into that selection process. And it, which will tell us why they are timed the, the right. way they are timed. Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now take questions from Council Member Ressler, followed by Council Member Ose and Council Member Sanchez. Council Member Ressler. Okay, we'll move to Council Member Ose. The time will begin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Chair Aviles, for uh, holding this, this hearing and asking very important questions uh, on this matter. Um, you know, as a, a council member that has multiple uh, NYCHA residents within my district, this is definitely a topic of discussion that we're always engaging with. Uh, so I just do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, if, if RAD was to stop at this very moment, you know, no more projects moving forward, how will NYCHA meet the capital repair needs for its families? Well, we're working on a number of initiatives. I assume you've heard of the effort to establish the trust. Um, we're also developing a comprehensive modernization program. Um, but at this point, we're anticipating going forward with PACT. Okay. And, and this question may have been asked, you know, I, I talked on the, the hearing a little later, but um, if you could, you know, elaborate maybe for the record and how outreach is made to NYCHA tenants, um, especially being done when educating them about uh, RAD or PACT enrollment. Uh, can you go into a little bit what that outreach looks like, especially for those that, uh, you know, are coming to my office and saying they've never heard of, you know, RAD or PACT, nor did they agree for uh, it to become something um, that affects their lives? Sure. Um, I will actually turn it over to uh, Simon and Leroy, who run our engagement efforts. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. So the ways that we reach out to residents to educate them about PACT uh, happens in a number of different ways. Uh, my colleague Leroy Williams described some of the different efforts, but uh, we've uh, tried really hard to prepare a lot of different materials um, that actually get distributed directly to residents. Uh, kind of a double-edged sword of working during the height of the pandemic was that we actually weren't able to do in-person meetings. We switched completely to Zoom uh, and virtual, but we also, because of that reason, started distributing our uh, information packets to every single household. They were either door dropped, door knocked, um, or direct mailed. And um, I have here for the members uh, in the room today uh, just some examples of some of those fact sheets. Um, Leroy has an example of a packet. Uh, every household gets this information in English and Spanish at their door. Uh, so there's really uh, not a lot of ways uh, around getting this material, unfortunately. Um, but we uh, have been hosting information sessions on a number of different topics. Uh, the General Pact 101, uh, how the program works, the nuts and bolts, the process and timeline. Uh, we have a session that goes into detail on the resident rights and protections provided through the program. Uh, and we also have a session focused on the design and construction process and how to prepare for that transition to project-based Section 8. How do you make repairs now with a private manager? Um, how do you certify your income? Uh, all those other really important uh, things. Uh, and in addition to just material distribution, uh, we'd be happy to send you all this information, actually, so that if you do have people walking into your office, uh, it'd be great just to have that as a resource. We have a hotline people can call. Uh, we have an email address. Uh, and then as Leroy described, uh, which you can go into a little more detail if necessary, we're hosting office hours, and we do tabling events. We attend community events in addition to those more formal uh, presentations. Great, thank you. And the last question I, I, I want to ask you both uh, is, are there tenants that have been evicted post-RAD or PACT? 
Uh, if so, what is the eviction rate? And, and what is NYCHA doing to protect tenants from being evicted post a RAD or PACT uh, conversion? So last year, uh, we took a look at um, the developments that had gone through PACT and looked at uh, eviction rates going backwards. So let's say Ocean Bay, at that point in time, Ocean Bay had um, been converted for about five years. So we looked back five years to see what the eviction rates under NYCHA were. And we did this for each of the developments that had converted up to that point. Um, so obviously the duration of time shrinks. Like the, at the time, the most recent closing or conversion was the Manhattan Bundle. Um, and so the time from conversion to when we did the analysis was about a year, and so the time backwards was about a year. But what we found was that the evictions were pretty consistent, both under NYCHA and under PACT, and we can supply this data in a more robust form to, to the members. Um, but I will say, one of the things that we're also doing, um, even though the actual, I know there's a lot out there, but the actual evictions are very similar to what it was like under NYCHA management, um, you know, we don't, we still want to get those numbers down. We want to make sure that evictions are an extreme, extreme last resort. And so in late 2020, again, as uh, in, consistent with our ongoing commitment to improving the program and improving the lives of our residents, we developed a housing retention strategy and we require our development partners um, to adhere to this. And so what does that mean? So there's a number, and we can share this with you, by the way, so you can have the full document. But basically, what we want them to do is know their customer, really understand their customers, making sure that when residents run into some trouble, that they work with them to provide the resources, to provide the opportunities, to provide uh, direction as to how to, you know, course correct. So for example, if somebody's income was reduced for whatever reason, Instead of just saying, oh, they didn't pay their rent, so they've fallen behind by a month, falling behind by a second month, and then moving to a proceeding, they go to that resident and they say, what's going on? Did you, you know, what's, what's the situation here? And maybe they're not aware that they can recertify and have their rent adjusted. So there's a whole suite of um, recommendations that we built into this framework, and we are requiring, again, all of our development partners to adhere to this to make sure that evictions are an extreme last resort. Thanks. I'd like to follow up a question around this. I mean, obviously, the last two years, we've had an eviction moratorium, and there's severe concern that, I mean, we are seeing this all across the private market, which is why there is such a concern under private management. We know what the private sector does to low-income tenants who fall on hard times. They evict them. Um, we have the highest eviction filings in a long time, so we're deeply concerned. Um, are there any particular mechanisms that you can put in place besides be nice to your customers uh, for well, these private management nice. companies? <laughs> it's more than being nice. We get reporting every month, and we question them, and we make sure that they are adhering to these requirements, and I would say requirements. It's not about being nice. The other thing I would say is development partners have no incentive to evict anybody. Um, for financial reasons or, or other things, because at the end of the day, they can only fill a vacant apartment with somebody off of our wait list. So it's not as if there's an opportunity to evict someone who get, runs into some type of issue and then replace them, you know, charge market rent and, and bring in somebody else. It's just not, it's just not possible. Got it, so, we, so what I have here is Wavecrest um, has attempted to evict 3% of their residents after conversion. Uh, Wavecrest holds quite a, quite a number of units. Um, outside of the ones that were outlined in the Human Rights Report, which we've all, the Human Rights Watch Report, we've all looked at, um, there also seems to be quite a number of uh, reporting of uh, 308 eviction warrants being issued um, in the years after PAC conversion at Ocean Bay. 99 warrants executed um, and 33 eviction warrants at Betances houses after the PAC conversion all held by Wavecrest. So there's no question there other than a comment of we would like to see what the, sure. what the safeguards are specifically and ensure given the fact that we no longer have an eviction moratorium and we've seen NYCHA itself have seen the revenues plummet from rent 
uh, is significant rental arrears, what private companies are gonna do in this regard since we are not out of the pandemic. Um, we are very deeply concerned about, about this possibility. Absolutely. Um, I'd also like to recognize council. We were joined by council member De La Rosa. Thank you, council member, for joining. We'll now take questions from council member Sanchez. The other one. Yeah. Councilmember Sanchez. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so, so first, uh, thank you, Councilmember Aviles, for for chairing this hearing on this this critical topic. And uh, to NYCHA folks, uh, good, good to see you all. Uh, we, we worked very closely on the Fulton process. And so I have two questions. One is on engagement and the other one is a continuation of Council Member Aviles' questions uh, earlier on developer fees and, and profits. So on engagement, um, you all know, the world knows, I am a true believer in community engagement and resident engagement in giving folks a seat at the table and respecting folks for, for the brilliance that we have. Everybody, everybody, you know, is coming from a place of expertise, especially when it's about where you've lived, especially if you've lived there for many years, right? Uh, President Miguel Acevedo was uh, your, his leadership at the, on the Fulton process, along with Chelsea and Elliot uh, leaders, really carried that process that put residents at, at, the, at the front and center. And I, I always talk about the Fulton process, which you all started off by doing, but I also want to share with colleagues that it's, it's, not rec it's not replicable, right? You had a city hall staffer uh, at the time uh, who was ensuring that uh, deputy mayor level folks were engaged. The deputy mayor herself was engaged in that process. The mayor attended some meetings uh, on the Fulton process. And there was, there was a level of attention and concern that I think proved that community engagement can work and, and is critical and, and can, can be successful. Uh, but there was another part of that that is, what about when you don't have that le level of leadership? And so I, as, as you all know, have uh, the Northwest Bronx bundle, uh, nine developments that are going through rat and pack conversion in my district. Uh, six, well, six of them are in my district, three of them are in uh, District 15. And many of my buildings are unrepresented, meaning that they are these buildings that Simon talked about earlier, Vice President uh, Simon talked about earlier, that are these difficult to reach and difficult to manage buildings because you know they were converted at a different time and they did just have different realities. I have knocked on these buildings doors. I will confess, I didn't completely register that they were NYCHA buildings, but I recently, because of a slate of complaints of just people walking into my office, uh, about these buildings, that's how they came to my attention. Not, not through the Northwest bundle, not, not through the, the RAD conversion. They came to our attention in January because of, of uh, the complaints, you know, roofs caving in, holes in the floors, refrigerators that were not working for months. So two, two engagement questions is, what happens now? What happens now during the, uh, uh, the, the RFEI process, you're, you're all, you're preparing to talk to residents and, and you're sort of kind of doing it, not very much at my unrepresented developments, which is a different conversation uh, that I'm, I'm happy to be having with you. But what about repairs now, right? Uh, before the conversion, before those millions of dollars in capital influx. And, and second, you know, for, for my under uh, unrepresented developments, meaning that they don't have a tenant association, you know, you, you all had a meeting uh, in for, for the Northwest Bronx bundle, um, and you had one resident of all of District 14 um, and not from the unrepresented uh, developments. So how, how many of uh, buildings that are going through PACT are from these unrepresented buildings? And what is your plan? Because you, can, you don't have a TA to rely on like Mr. Miguel and, and like TAs in other buildings. Um, you, you have to build from scratch, right? The, the, that engagement and leadership hasn't been there. So I'll, I'll stop there. And if I have a chance for my second one, I'll, I'll make that point. Um, thank you, Council Member Sanchez. Uh, I absolutely agree that residents need to be centered. Uh, the reason we're doing this is for them. 
uh, and so their expertise about their communities, um, their goals really need to be integral to whatever plans uh, it is that we collectively develop together. I also really uh, appreciate your um, interest in making sure that the developments in your community um, have a seat at the table uh, and are full participants in that process from start to end. Uh, we have had conversations in recent weeks about how to recruit more residents to participate in the review committees for your unrepresented developments, uh, and uh, recently emailed a plan. So we're going to work on that together with you uh, to make sure that we can uh, conduct door knocking, uh, distribute more flyers, uh, make more calls to residents, uh, and try to make sure that we get more people uh, involved. Uh, the challenge with a lot of our smaller developments, like the ones that you described, are also, because they're small, they tend to not have resident leadership, uh, actually, you know, formal resident association leadership, and that is a challenge that we've um, had to navigate as well. But I, I think the issue that you raise uh, is really important, and, and, and we want to make sure that we're recruiting more people to represent. Um, Leroy, do you want to add to how we might recruit? I do want to add that um, we will be hosting large um, group meetings in that area. Um, there's the Boys and Girls Club there on University Avenue that's very close to the actual development, and we're now um, talking to them about use of space. So the same type of meetings we're having in, in the Upper North Bronx and, um, and the other side of the, the scattered sites, um, we're going to be having meetings. Again, we did send over a plan for engagement where, you know, I taking offline nine of the staff members um, to knock on every door of your entire um, district during the day and evening times. Because um, of course people go to work and everything else. So we want to make sure that we you know, get as many residents as possible. We're not just talking to them about the resident review committee, but we're also going to be talking about what is PAC as a whole, right? Um, that hopefully leads to people wanting to be involved in the selection of our developers. So, you know, I look forward to further working with you as I worked with you in the past. And I'm, you know, I'm very for engagement. So anything that's new and anything that's innovative, please bring it to me and I will make sure that we can do that. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how to do sign language to say, please unmute me. Um, no, thank you. Thank you. And, and I'll just say, you know, the broader question is how many of, of buildings that are slated for PAC conversion are the, in these kinds of buildings because they need a completely different kind of engagement. So thank you for, for, for working with my team on that. Um, but I, I, I would want to see a bigger picture. And honestly, like I, I'm not going to feel comfortable with moving forward with the process if it's one, one tenant or two tenants of all of these unrepresented developments that are involved, right? So I really look forward to working with you on that. Um, and Chair, if I may, uh, I'll just turn it into a comment and not a question. Um, but to, to follow up on your earlier questions about developer fees and what are they and you know what's the transparency with the public and with the council and the profit motive you know I I, I just want to say um, you know we we get as council members and and as people in the public we get asked all the time to trust right just trust that the city is structuring this deal in the best way possible just trust that NYCHA is structuring the deal in the best way possible. You know, I get approached by developers during the Euler process, we all do, um, who, who won't share their, you know, their, their uh, pro formas, who won't share their details because of the reasons that you say, but then don't expect us to trust, right? Don't, don't ex if, you don't, if you don't give us the information about what the, what the profit margins are, what the developer fees are, um, we have it on the section nine side. We don't have it on the section eight side. So I, I will uh, join council member Aviles in, in that push to give us more access and more transparency into what these fees are and what the financial structure of these deals are so that we can have a, have confidence when we talk to our constituents about, you know, what, what, um, how the city is structuring these deals and that we're doing the best because, uh, I, I don't think that the, the, the reality is, has been uniform throughout these conversions. And, you know, I think we need that information uh, in order to, to really stand with you if that's warranted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member. Uh, it looks like we've been rejoined by Council Member Ressler, so we'll take questions from him now. Great. Um, sorry, I've had some technical difficulties, but um, I just firstly want to thank 
our chair, um, Alexa Aviles, for your leadership here. Um, it was a real, um, I really appreciated your poignant and thoughtful uh, opening and remarks uh, and questions and really deeply appreciated you taking the time to join us in South Williamsburg yesterday to meet with a few of our tenant leaders and hear from them about their experience. Uh, you were incredibly generous with your time and uh, asked all of the right questions. And I just um, feel very strongly that uh, we have the right person in the right role uh, with you as chair of this committee. And I really appreciate you holding and prioritizing this hearing uh, early on in the year uh, because there are a lot of open questions and concerns about rat and pack conversions. Uh, we've had four of the seven NYCHA developments in our district undergo conversions um, just as the pandemic was about to, uh, just as the pandemic struck in, in March of 2020. And there was a fair amount of support from residents for the conversions. Um, it's There's been definitely some positive developments of new boiler systems, sewage backups have stopped, uh, we have new elevators and new roofs going in and developments that, that desperately needed them. Um, but we've had issues as well. And I, I wanted to, in fact, start on a, the issue that gives me the most agita, which is around uh, the risk of evictions. And for, for these four developments, we've, of course, had the eviction moratorium in place for, for essentially the entire time. But to the NYCHA team, uh, and Jonathan, it's, it's good to see you. Um, is there is there protection for or a guarantee of uh, right to counsel for any tenant who is facing an eviction proceeding in any and all rat and pack developments? Uh, well, we don't have an automatic right to counsel per se, although residents can um, can access the legal aid hotline and and leverage that service that we provided to all packed residents. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we don't want to see evictions uh, happening. We want to minimize them to the greatest extent possible, which is why, and I don't know if you were on earlier, um, you know, we have done a lot around uh, developing a set of expectations and requirements and strategies with our PAC partners to ensure that they're reporting to us on a monthly basis what is going on in terms of residents that may be running into some sort of issue that could theoretically put them on a path to eviction, and then making sure that they're taking steps and working with their residents to avoid that outcome. That sounds like a positive thing. I haven't seen it uh, on the ground in the ways that I would hope. And you know, certainly the reports of what occurred in Ocean Bay, I think, freaked everybody out across the city. And I think NYCHA's done a pretty good job in driving down evictions from NYCHA developments. And, uh, but I am, I am very concerned about what's going to happen in these developments. And I, I realize that it's not your preference to see people evicted. And, and I will say when I speak to Arthur and Omni or Reliant and Progressive or whatever they call them, they're, they're rad packed entities, um, you know, they say the right things to me, but I don't see the proactive tenant engagement around eviction prevention. And more importantly, we all know that the best way to stop an eviction from happening is to provide counsel. And so it has, um, and it's a relatively modest expense on the part of these developers and NYCHA, and it is of utmost importance. And if this is not something that has yet been baked into the program, despite extensive advocacy, I don't see any choice but to pursue legislative solutions. And um, I really do hope that you know you'll reconsider and guarantee a right to counsel, just as low-income tenants should have that same access to counsel, right to counsel, uh, uh, citywide. Um, I also wanted to express my reservations uh, uh, to the ongoing RAD and PAC conversions. I think that the trust is a preferable model to RAD and PAC. And I would strongly encourage NYCHA, while you pursue federal funding in what is hopefully a successful Build Back Better, um, uh, slim down version, and uh, make another push for the trust up in Albany next year to put a hold on RAD and a pause on RAD and PAC conversions for a 12 month period and try and build as much support as you can to 
make that uh, happen. Um, I'll just ask one final, uh, make one final point in, in closing, if, if, if you wouldn't mind commenting on that and, and this final point. Um, in my experience, some of the, the areas where we've had, the, there's been less deliberate thoughtfulness around some of the non kind of core NYCHA functions. So the, the tenant, the resources for the tenant associations have been very hard to access. We've had inconsistency even in our own district between whether PSA continues to take responsibility for the route impact developments or not. Um, so some of the non-core um, NYCHA functions uh, and kind of housing related, I think have been overlooked and not implemented consistently. Um, and so I really do hope as your, as the portfolio has now expanded quite a bit, that that, that is changing um, and that you come back to us in, in District 33 uh, and address some of the issues that were overlooked during the conversion a couple of years ago. Thank you. Um, am I permitted to respond? So two things. On the right to counsel, just to clarify, um, there is the citywide program, so NYCHA residents uh, can avail themselves of that program. I wasn't sure if you meant uh, specific to NYCHA and PACT, um, but they can avail themselves of the city program. Um, and then as it relates to your request uh, to pause PACT while we work on the trust and other initiatives, I'd say a couple of things. First, we are going to continue to work on the, on the trust and, and other programs and try to get as much capital as possible because we do believe we need a range of options uh, to bring capital into our buildings. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think we can really, it's not realistic to stop the active PAC projects. What I would like to do is work with this committee and other members to continually improve that which we have ongoing. Um, we have about 19,000, almost 20,000 units that are in some stage of engagement that are in procurement. And I understand, we've heard today, there's some mixed feelings about PAC, but we, for the most part, do have residents who now want to see improvements that we've promised them. So I think we would be doing them a disservice if we pause those active projects. Um, and also, the buildings are not going to wait for us. They're going to continue deteriorating. So we need to take action on those buildings as soon as possible. Well, look, I appreciate this. Uh, I appreciate that the conditions are unacceptable and that we need urgent investment. I continue to be very concerned about the model of private management. and. Clearly, it's had uneven implementation across the city. And I think that, uh, I understand if you're mid-procurement on something that it can be hard to slow down, but to continue to pursue new route and pack sites when you're trying to build goodwill and political support for, a, I think, a, a better model, um, I don't, I think you're, uh, you're undermining uh, your ability to actually get that done by continuing to advance what you know is a is a I think a, a, a um, problematic model, and so I, you know I hope you know, it's, it's a political decision for you all to make. We just continue to rethink it uh, as we move forward. Thank you. And I appreciate appreciate the comment. And, and, and on the PSA piece, it, it would be helpful to have consistency in that approach and improve access to TAs to the funds that they're owed. I, you know, we've created needless bureaucracy, and, and I think the nitrogen developments, tax developments, continue to want to have, uh, I think, partnership with the PSA, not with the prison. So I do want to say that we have met with um, the police department, and any development that currently are under the PSA will continue to receive services from the PSA. And if the particular um, development has a precinct, they'll continue to have the precinct. Why, why wouldn't they? They're taxpayers. We agree. So I don't, I'm just answering the question okay. that he had about, um, you know, I mean, it's suggesting residents. a disruption in service or a confusion around I think relationships. It was just a, I think it was just a question from residents to ask when they go over to this Section 8 um, program, will the PSA continue? And we want to make sure that we're all on the same page by saying yes, they will. And we have met with the um, hired up in the police department, and we all agree that they will continue to have that service. Got it. Thank you. In terms of, I, I just want to follow up on uh, Councilmember Ressler's um, observation 
around the RAD Impact program and a call for a, a pause. I think while, while we all feel the urgency, obviously, of um, the conditions of the apartments and what tenants are having to contend with on a daily basis, um, it is mind-blowing the level of public investment that we have invested in this strategy with no real assessment of it to date. Um, and, and that to me is deeply concerning, particularly in the context of a soon to be budget where the only additional allocation for strategy is into RAD impact and not into the rest of um, the, uh, the, the rest of the units that remain outside, which are still the majority <laughs> of units that are in dire need of capital repair. So I think for the record, that's more of a comment, um, not a question. Um, I did want to ask particularly around, um, around for the, the grievance process um, in terms of one of, the, one of the things that has emerged is that the management companies have their own particular systems of billing and, and NYCHA has its own system of billing and the two systems don't often communicate and people are often getting conflicting or incorrect uh, rental uh, invoices. Can you tell us how NYCHA engages with that? What are the standards that are set for the management companies? And in terms of any grievance procedures for disputes over overcharging, um, is there a process uh, for Section 8 tenants to engage in there that is standardized? It would be helpful at a, another time, perhaps, to get into some of the specifics to understand wh what these issues are so we can address them head on. Um, but I would ask uh, Marissa Schaefer to uh, chime in on some of the process that we have as it relates to grievance. Sure. Thank you. Um, so NYCHA requires that the PACT partners um, provide grievance procedures similar to those established under public housing. Um, recently, we established a standard grievance procedure to, to establish that consistency across all PACT projects. Um, you know, as I think the notable difference is that as a public housing resident before a RAD conversion, all tenant grievances were processed by NYCHA. After the RAD conversion, it depends on the issue. Some grievances will be processed by the new property manager and some by NYCHA. So grievances concerning matters involving Section 8 rental assistance, such as adding household members, um, calculation of rent, reasonable accommodations requests, those will continue to be processed by NYCHA as the agency administering the Section 8 rental subsidy. And then the issues relating to lease, uh, lease issues or lease violations, those would be grieved directly to the property manager. Thank you, certainly that clarification across developments is sorely needed. Uh, folks do not know where to go. And in particular, I mean, this leads to the larger issue of, you know, kind of jurisdictional questions around when management companies are not performing their duties. Um, where do residents go? I, I touched on earlier this kind of uh, spiral of death where you call 311, 311 sends you back to NYCHA, and NYCHA says they're not, it goes back to RAD, and they call the management company and there's nobody there to answer the question. Can you, for the record, make clear, under PACT, who are the management companies um, accountable to for repairs? So in terms of, I'll take that first part, and then if you wanted more granular details on repairs generally, and I see Brad is joining, because um, there's probably a compliance piece here, so we'll, we'll touch him as well. Um, but ultimately, to us, I mean, again, we, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have a number of uh, units within NYCHA, both the real estate group, the design and construction team, the asset management team, and our chief compliance officer, and everyone is watching to ensure that uh, these repairs are happening uh, accordingly, it's from the minor, seemingly minor type of things to, uh, you know, environmental type hazards. Um, I will invite Brad to sort of talk about some of the bigger stuff, and then we can get into, you know, some of the more granular details, if you like. Um, 
Thanks, Jonathan. So there's a bunch of uh, forums a resident can come to NYCHA with uh, a repair request for or escalate an issue they have with their property manager. Um, one is they can call the call center that they're used to when they were a public housing resident, which is the CCC 718-707-7771. There's two options that they can press when they call that number. One is they can press two for the leased housing department, which will do a special inspection. The leased housing department also has to do regular inspections every year, and if someone doesn't pass an inspection, a manager doesn't pass the inspection, their subsidy can be cut off if they don't correct the condition. They can also call my department, which is if they press seven at that same number, uh, my department accepts complaints from PAC residents just like we accept complaints from any other resident in the NYCHA portfolio. Um, we'll chase down information about that particular complaint um, using Jonathan's asset management team, but also the lease housing department. And if we need to, we, we often call the resident directly and try to understand exactly what the problem is with the manager. And we'll reach out to the developer and escalate up the chain within the developer as well to understand exactly what the problem is. Um, we also make visits to packed properties, just like we do to NYCHA properties with our investigators um, to try to understand the business process challenges they're having assessing a complaint. So those are two NYCHA options that residents have. Like you said, um, packed residents can also call 311 and get HPD involved. Um, we also now this month have launched the Ombuds Prison Call Center. Um, we have an agreement now with the bias plaintiffs around how we expect our PAC partners to handle mold and leak complaints. And if a resident feels that their manager is not appropriately assessing mold, remediating mold, or um, assessing and remediating leak conditions, they should call the OCC. Um, that number is 1-888-341-7152. It functions very similarly to how the uh, resident might have been used to dealing with the OCC when they were a NYCHA resident. Um, and it's a really good program to get really critical repairs done as well. So we do encourage residents to use it. Um, but like I said, yeah, sometimes we give so many options, I understand it can be confusing when there are so many options, almost more confusing than if you just had one. Uh, but we do want to give residents the opportunity to use many different forums to escalate a problem they might have with their manager. Um, we're adding people in the compliance department to this function all the time because we recognize there's more units going into the program. Um, I know Jonathan's asset management team is doing the same thing so that we make sure that you know our relationship with the resident doesn't stop when they convert, it continues and we can address any concerns they have. How many people are in the compliance department? Uh, we have 50, around 50 people in the compliance department, not all dedicated to the PAC program. People obviously deal with many, many different components of NYCHA's compliance, um, um, including the public housing side as well. Um, we have around 50 people. How many, pe how many of the 50 though are dedicated to um, PAC? Um, we don't really think of it that way. We do have a team that does, that we call it our contractor and equal opportunity compliance team that deals a lot with the PAC program at both a high level and also a very granular level. I'll give an example of what, they, what they've been doing for the recently converted developments. Um, but they will, we, we, when we convert the properties, um, we hand over work orders that were in our system to the PAC partners. I think in the past, I would totally acknowledge that there was a gap in making sure the work actually got done upon conversion or tracking it to make sure it got done. So we put every single work order and every unit that had an active mold and leak complaint in a smart sheet. And we go one by one through each unit with the PAC partners. We do weekly meetings with them. We require them to provide us photos, documentation, other documentation. If it's a mold condition, they have to give us a mold assessment, show us the mold remediation took place with a licensed mold assessor, doing the backup check on the back end as well. And then we call the resident to make sure they're satisfied with the repair. So we go through that with almost every single unit that got converted in the last few sites. Um, we have a mighty team of three working just on that project, but they also do other kinds of business process mapping with, with some of our PAC partners. And then we have complaint specialists on another team that also will take complaints from PAC partners just like they would a public housing side. So, um, and they spend their time doing both. So it's not like they are only PAC, they're only public housing. So, so po post conversion, um, what is what is the auditing look like of of uh, the sites? Um, so, I'll talk about the compliance side, and then maybe Jonathan can talk about asset management. On the compliance side, like I said, in, for the immediate months right after conversion, which we want to show that this program, we want this program to provide immediate relief to tenants. So, we don't want folks to wait two, three years for the rehab to take place. So, if you have an active um, like Ms. Coleman and I were just talking earlier. She was showing me a case in Boulevard, which converted somewhat recently, and we'll check to see if it's on our sheet for tracking purposes. But like I said, we'll literally go one by one. It's not an audit, it's not a sample. We go one by one and see 
what the conditions of each unit are, and we check all the documentation. Um, then from that point forward, um, like Jonathan can talk about, asset his asset management team collects reporting from each developer about what the conditions are in terms of assessing very high, uh, high, high risk repairs like pests, elevators, heat, uh, mold, and we um, will now, we, we monitor those reports and we uh, will take a sample as well from those going forward, especially on the mold front. If folks aren't hitting the 30 day requirements of the bias case, we'll also be doing our own compliance follow up on that. I don't know if you want to talk about what the asset management team does as well, but there's a lot of oversight in the repair process now. Uh, I mentioned this earlier in, I think, in my testimony and, and I think in response to a couple other questions, but we now have uh, monthly reporting, which has been up for about a year or so, um, and it is on a number of factors related to these conversions. So operations, we are looking at the financial health, we're looking at MW, uh, we're looking at Section 3 hiring. Um, and as Brad said, you know, we're looking at work orders. We want to make sure that, uh, the work orders in particular around things like pests, mold, um, elevators, heat, et cetera, um, are being addressed, number one, and number two, are being addressed in a timely fashion. Um, and those are sort of the big categories that our asset management team uh, is focused on. And what are the steps that, are be that will that would be taken if you find that the property management teams are not uh, meeting their benchmarks or, or these basic repairs? So far, we have been fortunate. Um, we have not seen any significant issues, and whenever we've had concerns, we've had conversations, and we've seen improvement. However, if we were ever in a situation in which uh, a partner uh, just flagrantly was choosing or in a, in a, unable to actually fulfill their requirements, uh, we do have the right to remove the partner from the team and bring in another property manager. Um, that is something that we can do. Uh, we could also look at um, withholding the subsidy as an incentive to, you know, course correct. Thank you. I'm going to pass it along to uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Neely, who has questions. Time will begin. Uh, I believe uh, Councilmember Mealy has left the Zoom chat. Unfortunately, we made council member Mealy wait too long, so we will, we will get back to you. In terms of, I'd like to switch the conversation a little bit to, um, particularly to staffing. Um, how has RAD impacted the levels of, of union staff for NYCHA? We did get this question last evening and we were, were compiling that information, so uh, I will turn it to Jillian um, or Marissa to chime in on some of the details. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you know, the staffing levels are comparable to what they were uh, prior to the conversion. In some cases, of course, where needed, uh, staff complements have increased. Um, but I think more than anything, what you're seeing is just a different way of doing the work, which is more effective. Um, Jillian or Marissa, if you want to chime in on the exact numbers, that would be great. Sure. Um, so we only had the opportunity to, to pull specific information in a few instances um, since we received your question. But as Jonathan said, in general, um, staffing le levels increase um, by you know a margin, not not a huge margin, but um, do increase post conversion. I would say also significantly following pack conversions, we're typically able to um, set aside vacant units for live-in superintendents, which we don't have under NYCHA management. Um, so those are two of the key differences, but if there's any um, other information you'd like us to provide, we're happy to compile that after this hearing as well. Sure, I'd love to know how many of those um, increases in staffing are union, unionized work. And certainly what kind of, what kind of positions are we talking about? Are they part-time, full-time, and are they unionized positions? We'll do. In terms of um, 
has has rad uh had any effect on resident hiring particularly section three i don't even know if section three applies to rad conversions can you tell us a little bit about that it does and uh our current statistics are so the total placements are 251 uh jobs uh, through Section 3, and then specifically NYCHA residents would be 156 across um, Ocean Bay, Batanzas, Twin Parks, and High Bridge Franklin, Baychester and Murphy, Hope Gardens, uh, the Brooklyn Bundle, and the Manhattan Bundle. And um, obviously we've done more conversions since the Manhattan Bundle, and so we would expect to see those numbers continue to increase. And what would, what percentage would that represent in terms of employment opportunities, and I guess compared to investment, right? Because it's tied to the, the amount of subsidy. We can compile that for you and, and get that for you. We know often this is a standard that is uh, not met across NYCHA generally, so it's, it's particularly important to, to understand if this standard is also being met Absolutely. under, under PACT. Um, thank you for that. In terms of... Um, I think we are. So many questions. Um, so little time. I'd love to talk a little bit about um, the wait list process, which has certainly flagged, been flagged as, as a pain point. Mm -hmm. particularly on the rat impact um, and a a process that is often described as changing depending on who you talk to and very much a passing the buck depending on who you're talking which development you're talking about and when I say passing the buck I mean it's NYCHA it's HUD it's the private management company um, can you specifically walk us through what the process is um, for for transferring, for um, right sizing in apartments, um, and also for the wait list. Sure, we've been doing a lot of work on this and I'll turn it to Marissa to talk about the wait list and how we, we're currently viewing it. But just on, on the right sizing piece, I will say right out of the gate that it is a requirement of HUD, both in section nine and section eight to right size. Um, it is true that we may not have timely right-sized under Section 9 uh, over a number of years, um, but we do have to do it uh, through the conversion, not because of the conversion, but because we would have to do it anyway under Section 9 and Section 8. Um, but what is important here is that in order to do the right-sizing, there has to be an appropriately sized apartment within the development. So it is possible that someone could be in an apartment that's either too big or too small, um, but not be forced to leave or have to leave until an appropriately sized apartment comes up. So it's not as if, you know, you just start moving people around. They have, the apartment has to be vacated and available for someone to move in. Um, and then in just in terms of where we are with the wait list, if Marissa could um, give a little bit of guidance on that. Sure, so NYCHA, because we're the Section 8 subsidy administrator, we also manage the Section 8 wait list. Um, so following the conversion, a Section 8 waitlist opens specific to that development, and folks can add themselves to that waitlist and then be eligible to, um, to fill the vacant units at the development when they open up. Um, the property manager may assist residents in connecting them to, um, to NYCHA lease housing to ensure they're, they're on the waitlist, but the property manager does not manage the waitlist in any way. Um, neither does HUD. Uh, there are other HUD Section 8 programs where HUD does manage the waitlist, but not in the PAC program, because again, we're the Section 8 administrator, that's the role we play. Thank you for that. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get a b more stories around what it looks like on the ground. In terms of um, uh, In terms of the, the agreements that are made with social service providers under PACT, um, here is another pain point that's come to our attention. Um, 
there's very little clarity around what those contracts are, who are the social service providers in fact accountable to, um, what are the scope of the projects, can any of those items be made public so people understand what those relationships are and expectations. Um, so, that, thank you for that question. We actually uh, do not contract directly with the social service providers. That is the role of the PACT partner, so the development team. Um, they enter into a contract with the provider who then provides the services at their development. And so they're responsible for paying the provider and working with them to uh, develop a scope and a budget. Um, the services that our partners provide, uh, actually recently, in the last uh, year and a half or so, we updated our guidance to all of our partners to make sure that there is consistency across all of our developments in terms of the services that are provided. Um, I'll say first that all the services that are currently available on the site have to remain. So there are a number of community centers uh, that are operated by private, uh, nonprofit, community-based organizations at all of our developments by and large, um, and we uh, require that our partners retain uh, those operators in the spaces that they currently use. Uh, we also have an opportunity through these investments to make important repairs and upgrades to those spaces so that, you know, to Jonathan's point about how we're not just fixing the brick and mortar of the housing, we can also enhance uh, services and amenities at the development. Um, but one of the key things that we're asking all of our partners to do is really provide dedicated on-site social workers and case managers. Uh, and that's a service that NYCHA um, in the past had provided uh, in a more hands-on way and had moved, moved away from in recent years. We want to make sure that uh, as uh, you know, our residents are dealing with a lot of different issues, um, introducing this uh, program and the prospect of pretty significant renovations uh, to their home, disruptions, you know, there's no doubt that there's disruptions to people's daily life, uh, that they're supported uh, with people who are dedicated and on-site and who can really get to know them uh, and refer them on to the right kinds of services for their needs. That, that, that uh, is with respect to the the renovation process, but also after the property is finished construction, uh, if somebody is facing, uh, uh, you know, they've fallen behind on their rent and they have significant arrears or they need referral to health services, uh, anything like that, the partners are there and can help uh, provide those uh, that assistance. Thank, thank you for that. Um, that is very helpful. I, I will say there are a good number of sites under PAC where residents have said they have no idea what the social service providers are supposed to be doing, nor have they seen them on campus. Uh, so is are the social service provision elements also subject to compliance review on quality and service? Anything is subject to our review, so yeah, we'll take a look at it. If you want to but do you do it? Well, yeah, we, we have not in the past looked at the social service providers. We've mostly focused on maintenance, um, which is what we usually get from residents. I don't know that we've gotten that particular complaint before, but if you want to um, touch base after the hearing and we can talk about the sites that you're concerned about, we'll, we'll look into it. And I'll just add that we do, even though I mentioned that that arrangement is between the partner and the provider, uh, NYCHA does review and approve all of those arrangements. Uh, and we're playing a much larger role in that now. Uh, so one of the things that we want to do going forward uh, for the sake of transparency and so that residents uh, really understand uh, in, pl in writing, you know, all of the things that are going to come along with this program, not only the physical investments but also the programmatic things, is put that down into a document that they get uh, in their hands prior to conversion. Uh, so that all of that hopefully will be there for all to see and to understand. Uh, when it gets to that point, of course, the residents will have played a role in shaping those plans, so everything in there should be based on their needs uh, and their guidance, but we do want to make sure that there's more transparency going forward by memorializing all that information up front. Right, because even at, at the meeting I was at yesterday, um, no one knew the ser there, there was actually quite a lot of positive comments on the repairs that were made, the speediness, of which they were made over the time of COVID, which was really truly unheard of. And you know, there are definitely positive stories here. Um, however, those those residents, in the same token, also 
uh, are not only finding the relationships now with the social service providers to be very much in question and unclear, but also how they fare as resident associations under management and particularly no guidance around you know, TPA funds, how that's distributed, a whole new layer of expectation around, um, around reporting specifically and how to access funding with, with new layers of like requirements that TAs have never had uh, the structure or the, the support before. Uh, with, with no additional training and a management company that's like, I don't have any idea about that stuff. So I believe Jonathan spoke earlier about a new post-conversion unit, maybe in the last year, year and a half that we put together. Um, their main job is to meet with the resident associations, the community-based organizations on the ground, um, any kind of community leaders that are there. Um, they're there to assist with you know, TPA funds because we saw the gap. Um, where resident engagement was really assisting them in spending the funding, understanding how to spend in, things like that. Um, so we have the post-conversion unit. Um, just last week, they met with the associations and the management of Boulevard, um, Linden Houses, and Penn Workman, um, so that they can understand what their budgets are, what they can use the funding on, um, and also to go over how NYCHA did it um, talk to them about if this is the same course of action they want to move forward with or do they want to change it, right? So we want to make sure that whatever the way that it is going to go um, forth is that the residents are at the forefront of that. So most have, um, you know, agreed to try to do the same thing because it's been working for them and they got the card and they're able to um, access the funding, but because they didn't have that uh, resident engagement person um, assigned to them, there were some gaps, but now we have that post-conversion unit and then they'll be following them through the duration of this. So how does this particularly work with um, post-conversions are now under, the residents are under private management company, yet they want to apply for discretionary funding. City money cannot go to a private corporation. How, how have we mm -hmm. figured out that process? So um, some have, and again, this is very new because some of the sites have not gotten discretionary before and some have. Um, some are using their um, community-based organization that's on the grounds of their developments to be that th third party to, yeah, um, for the funding. Um, you know, I just um, talked to one of the um, developments in Berry Street about using their social services provider that's on the grounds as their pass-through. So we're working with them with that. So if NYCHA needs to step in, then we'll do so. But because most of these um, developments have the social service providers and CBOs on the grounds, it will be better for them to get the funding through that way because, again, we are a government agency and it's harder for us to do things than a CBO. Yes and no, when it turns when, for private funding or for government funding, for government funding going to a nonprofit who is passing through to an unincorporated entity could be problematic. Um, government funding also that's going to, I think in the case of these tenants, a higher threshold of reporting, right? Now they're being asked for liability insurance, they're being asked for a whole slew of documentation they never had to do because it was a government to government transaction and NYCHA as a public entity was taking um, or holding the liability. So I, there still seems to be very much a disconnect in what the, what the structures are. How do, I, literally I had this conversation yesterday with residents, so this is an area Clearly, there's some work to be done. Agreed. Um, thank you for that. In terms of, um, in, in terms of resident engagement, don't go. Um, one of the council members mentioned. Um, I guess I'd like to to know how community partners fare into this new engagement model around around you know pact conversions, quite frankly. We have seen, and NYCHA has a relatively strong track record at not doing great um, organizing or outreach to residents. We see that in the numbers of people involved, despite very 
serious attempts. That's not to say that they are not making that effort. Um, has there is there any consideration of partnering with community-based providers who have those rela trusted relationships with tenants to engage in robust outreach around educational efforts? Um, yeah, I can speak to that, and Leroy can, can chime in as well. Uh, one of the initiatives that we launched recently that Jonathan alluded to in his testimony is called the Pact Resource Team. Uh, and that was set up sort of like a fund that NYCHA um, created so that residents who want to take advantage of independent community-based organizations to help in whatever efforts, whether it's advocating for their needs as part of the PACT planning process, um, educating residents in their community about the program in a way that works best for them, uh, can use that. And so that's a resource that we're making available and we're paying for. Um, it's administered by LISC, NYC, and Public Works Partners uh, who lead it. Uh, they are responsible for uh, matching residents up with those partners. And they've actually created a pool of partners who are interested in engaging with NYCHA residents on these topics. Uh, LISC recently published it to their website. Uh, and we're always interested in partnering with additional organizations, so it's kind of a rolling application. Uh, but there are a lot of great community-based local organizations on that list, uh, as well as a lot of you know, consulting groups and advocates and research organizations who have experience with NYCHA residents. And the residents get to choose who they would work with. Got it, and it's through the whole scope, not just, uh, my understanding was particularly relegated to you know, the process the conversion process itself, but you're s stating that it is much broader than? It's really broad. We laid out uh, a kind of menu of options just to get, you know, the creative juices flowing around what kinds of things people could take advantage of. Um, I will say that this initiative was inspired by our experience with Fulton and Elliot Chelsea. They had a lot of uh, support from uh, advocates, elected officials, community-based organizations with experience doing this kind of work and really uh, I felt resulted in uh, a trusted process, you know, where we were saying things that residents could then um, really trust that we're giving them accurate information because it was vetted fully by their partners that they had there in the room defending and advocating for them. Yeah. I do, I'm sorry, I do want to add that they meet with the association presidents and the residents at large. So, you know, it's just not, you know, putting someone in a room with them and just saying this is what's happening, right? They're really at trying to get what their needs are so that they can come with partners that will really assist them. So in terms of the, obviously, LISC, it sounds like the administrator of, of the program. Are they subcontracting with smaller organizations that residents are choosing? And what are the scale of those subcontracts? Yeah, that's exactly how it works. So we have a master agreement with LISC, uh, and then they kind of work as a grantee to these organizations. Um, they serve as the overseer of all of the contracts. The size of those contracts is really to be determined based on the need of each development. Uh, we procured them through a process that um, has a not to exceed amount, which is very high. Uh, it's $10 million over five years. Um, but the amount of funding we would allocate to each development is really to be determined based on the need. Got it. Right, because this is just starting, this program. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think many organizations and would would well and tenants would welcome being able to partner with long-standing community-based organizations that have been helping them navigate pre-conversion standard NYCHA repair issues and in a post-conversion environment, um, particularly because they're both culturally competent and generally are multilingual. Um, so I I hope those contracts are actually um, are equitable. They are often not, and um, not sufficient for the level of outreach and engagement that it requires, um, and the expertise, quite frankly, it requires. So I'm encouraging appropriate level of subcontracts. So we'll see. Absolutely, I agree. We'll see, we'll see. Um, in terms of, uh, let's see.
So I guess right now we'll move forward to public testimony so we can hear um, from some of the advocates and, and residents. I would like, I would like to now um, call uh, Brenda Temple uh, to testify. And following that, it will be Danny Cabrera and Dana oh. Elvin. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Greetings to all. Thank you, Chair, and everyone who is opposed to privatization under any name. My name is Brenda Temple. I am a resident of Oceanside Houses, Far Rockaway, Queens. Yeah, we can't hear you. A New York City wide petition campaign to demand that Eric Adams stop the privatization of public housing and support residents to manage their housing developments. We residents of poor and HUD and NYCHA have let the conditions of our homes to over 600,000 New Yorkers decay, rot, and poison our people. Stop the privatization and end of public housing. NYCHA and the city of New York have been implementing RAD and PACT to turn management of public housing over to private developers who will make money, a lot of money, on our backs. Using government guaranteed financial vouchers, privatization of public housing ends public housing, and you know that. NYCHA won't provide oversight of developers and you know that. Section 9 offers federal protections to residents that developer-run Section 8 won't, and you know that. Privatization is nothing less than a vicious attack on the poor with shoddy repairs, increased rents, evictions, and displacement. You know that. You also know that we are the backbone of this society we have always been essential, and without us, this city or country would be doomed. Who else would clean your grandparents' bed sores, take care of your children, cook, clean, teach, protect, etc.? The silence of you, our, elect our elected officials in this New York City, is deafening. Did you all lack the political will? You say there's no money. Of course there's no money. When you are silent, when you don't fight on our behalf, your constituents, one in 14 New Yorkers who live in public housing, and you know that. Where are your priorities? We demand decent housing, keep public housing public. We want the resident managed our own homes. Will you, the New York City Council, do something to fight and protect public housing? These are human, moral, civil right crimes. Fund NYCHA now and stop the slow process of at the exodus of the hardworking, low-income residents of our city. So there are human rights that are being violated, and it's screaming systemic racism. So we are pushing back, and God bless you to give you the will to do the next right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Temple. Since you cut out in the audio a little earlier, just for a couple of seconds, would you submit your, testi your, your testimony um, by email so we can have your yes, complete I statement? Have. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll take testimony from Danny Carrera followed by Dana Eldon and Diana Blackwell. Good afternoon, my name is Danny Cabrera and I'm a policy analyst at Citizens Housing and Planning Council. As we all know, NYCHA is in desperate need of more resources due to a history of disinvestment to address its $40 billion capital repair, repair backlog. To date, 
Pack slash Rad is the only currently accessible tool NYCHA has available to substantially invest in and improve the living conditions of residents. NYCHA residents should not have to worry about whether or not they'll have heat or hot water during frigid winter days. NYCHA residents shouldn't have to worry um, about whether, whether a never-ending possibility of a leak can occur in their apartment. These conditions are unacceptable and their persistent ramifications of disinvestment that need to stop and be rectified. Our city's public housing residents deserve so much better. As mentioned, the PACS program provides a solution by meeting and exceeding the outstanding capital needs of developments to fully restore and renovate buildings, to provide residents with the housing quality and services they deserve. CHBC is pleased to see NYCHA and the city understands the success of PACT and the pre preservation of NYCHA requires investment and also requires centering resident voices as resident decision makers in the process of preserving their own homes. CHPC's research from London highlights how London's public housing conditions were radically improved by doing so. Traditionally, we know NYCHA has provided uh, its residents with forms to obtain information and address concerns. The, the degree of involvement allowed residents to be heard, but didn't necessarily position them as decision makers. However, now NYCHA is taking a dramatically new approach inspired by resident decision making in London. Over the past year, NYCHA has proven to be nimble in developing and implementing the PACT resource team and the formation of resident review committees. These are not just welcome changes to the PACT process, but historic. NYCHA's resident review committees provide residents from developments entering the PACT program with a true seat at the, at the table to evaluate PACT proposals for their developments, interview PACT development teams, and ultimately select the plan and team best suited for their homes. Residents are directly shaping the future of their homes and NYCHA is emerging as a national leader in doing so. No other housing authority in the United States of America provides public housing residents with this level of decision-making power. Beyond these historic new processes that ensure residents are decision-makers, through CHBC's research, we have seen early examples that PAC slash RAD can be successful. In 2018, we conducted an evaluation of the Triborough pilot projects, which utilize a similar structure to, to RAD's public private uh, public-private model for six NYCHA properties. CHBC compared work order for triborough properties with a group of properties that remained under NYCHA control. We found that after investments were complete and the new management in place was in place, the number of work orders fell, and more importantly, the response time substantially improved. We also conducted a tenant survey and found from hundreds of residents of, and, and learned about learned from hundreds of residents of their impressions of the rehab. The results were unsurprising. When you spend millions of dollars to modernize a development, tenants, when tenants get a new kitchen, a new bathroom, new operating system, residents are happier. However, we also did find residents in Triborough reported feeling safer, rated day-to-day -day management as more responsive, and experienced quicker repair times than NYCHA residents in similar NYCHA properties. So while the PACT program isn't perfect, there are very encouraging signs here that something new and historic is emerging. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. We'll now hear from Dana Eldon, followed by Diana Blackwell and Karen Leader. Your time will begin. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Aviles, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, there have been so much discussed this afternoon. Um, I am a resident president uh, from the South Bronx, from St. Mary's to be precise, and we are not RAD or PAC. Uh, but the proposition has, a, has been approached. Uh, we've also been propositioned to be resident management. Uh, the criteria that I see for residents and the conversion in regards to seniors and disabled seniors like myself, who is wheelchair bound, uh, is unclear. Uh, and I feel that at the end of the day, that some of us are not being heard. Uh, also, in regards to the red cap of 30%, uh, it would not apply to many of my residents. St. Mary's originally was a middle class development where we had to have a certain amount of income to live here until 1980 when the ACLU took us to court and sued. And we were then open to open residency. At the end of the day, many of those working pro uh, professionals are now in, in their latter years. Uh, 
some in their 70s, 80s. I even have a resident who's 104. Uh, so they receive pensions as such, uh, besides this, their Social Security. Section 8 is not going to work for them. They're already paying ceiling rents. And at the end of the day, even being relocated is not going to work for them. Uh, such as myself, I live alone, so I have no one that would be able to help me uh, maneuver that type of feat. And so I fear that those that are in RAD impact will be ignored um, and insufficiently treated in regards to those relocations. Also, we are being forced into Section 8, uh, which I think is unlawful. We should be able to remain Section 9, and those that want to be Section 8 will make that choice. There's nothing legal in this matter, as far as I'm concerned, to force any resident into a Section 8 program that they do not want to be in. As a, as a president here, I've seen how Section 8 has treated my residents, and it is, it is awful. They're being ignored. Some of their repairs have to wait until they get an approval. They don't get their, their, um, their inspections done on time. It's just unheard of how they're being treated. Um, and I'm totally against it. Um, as far as the leverage uh, that, that Section 8 would bring to NYCHA and these prospective uh, private managements, uh, how much more could it be that they, they would force us into a program that we don't want? And I, I just blatantly, I refuse RAD, in fact, I refuse Section 8, and so do many of my residents. And I think that we're not being heard. Uh, everybody has a solution, but they're not talking to us. And I think that's very unfair. And it's, it's criminal, actually, to put someone that's over, you know, over age into a system that they don't want to be in and then to move them about while they do these repairs. And although you mentioned Spatanzas being so one of those renovated uh, developments that's now in PAC or RAD, I talked to the residents of Batanzas, and they still having issues with with mold and leaks. Things it it was just a facade that facade that they that they had when they replaced the the outside. They gave them new countertops and and cabinets and bathroom, but the real problems that they have were not addressed. So. I, I'm a, I'm against this program. I'm against both programs, RAD, PAC, and I'm against Section 8. And that's all I have to say. Have a great day. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. We'll now hear from Diana Blackwell, followed by Karen Leader and Marquise Jenkins. Your time will begin. Uh, good afternoon, um, Madam Chair. My name is Diana Blackwell, and I'm president of Fred Samuel in Central Harlem. Today, I'm not only going to testify for myself, but on behalf of several other developments. I've been on RAD, the RAD committee from the onset and have remained active communicating with many of those who have converted from Section 9 to Section 8 under this program. Some of the most significant ways that some of the residents expressed that they were impacted was when they started experiencing the quality of life that they had deserved. Homes are now healthier, safety, safer, and more secure. Uh, some residents are now working who were able to work in the past and now can pay their rents. They're able to uh, access social services for issues pertaining to health, rental assistance, mediation, and other services. Overall, they're proud to be living where they are and can bring guests and not be ashamed. For me personally, our development will be a sustainable development, and I'm very happy about that. On the other hand, there are those who believe that this process has a new, uh, nugatory effect and has expressed how they wish they had not left NYCHA in that the services or lack of them were yet fully operational, noting especially some senior buildings. Communication with management is not very responsive. Repairs of internal fixtures such as mold, mildew are repeating the same 
way they did under NYCHA management. Now, I believe, and I am a supporter of the RAD PAC program, but I'm working to see that the work that we did on the round table comes to fruition. Our development, Samuel City, is in round nine. And I found that there has been a number of changes since we began. They're good changes, but they seem to be uh, such as, uh, I want to say that resident involvement. We were one of the first to participate in the resident selection of the developer. To date, this joint effort is working to the tenant's advantage. Our communication is two-sided. They're listening to us and we're talking. They're responding and we're challenging them. We know that we won't get everything we ask, but our tenants won't stop trying. This is a work in progress. If it is to be successful, it will take a joint effort between NYCHA, the new developers and residents. Residents must be the oversight that is needed to assure that this is working, that it is, is going correctly going forward. Okay, I'll just conclude right here. Uh, it's critical that we get this right because today there's no other funding sources that can repair these physical distress properties nor the lives that are within them. The program is not perfect, but it is needed now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Blackwell, and I can't agree with you more. We must get this right. And there are, have been a number of lessons and information that we've gathered here in the hearing today that um, we have to be sure to implement and, and lean into wholeheartedly. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Karen Leader, followed by Marquise Jenkins and Letitia McNeil. Your time will begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, the members of the committees on housing and all present. My name again is Karen Leader, and I'm executive on the executive board at Cooper Park Houses, a part of WE Act and RPPH. NYCHA residents remain in opposition of our homes being put into the hands of another private landlord. Let's call RAD and the trust what it is. It's greenwashing. There are several problems with this RAD conversion. The new leases are confusing to the residents. They contain unreliable content and they are also take away many resident protections. Residents are being deceived into believing that this conversion is the best thing since sliced bread. Why is everyone other than residents ignoring the fact that evictions are happening at a faster and higher rate under these private companies? NYCHA believes that RAD and the trust offers them hope and that there will be a steady source of funding, which includes ability to borrow money. However, borrowing money means that collateral is needed. Our homes are being used as collateral without the necessary legislative protections in place in the case of a default. It is said that you, the city, may step in if there should be a, a default. However, may means that there is the possibility that you may not step in. Instead of putting your trust in the trust or in the rent, we are asking that you trust residents to own and manage these properties through the use of subsidies, bonds, and other sources. The resources are there. If the governor can negotiate a new stadium at the cost of $850 million in taxpayers' dollars, why aren't NYCHA residents receiving a substantial amount? If our political leaders have boosted U.S. military spending, why are we being offered coins to cover our operational expenses and capital repairs? If Congress can approve $13.6 billion in emergency spending to help Ukraine fight against Russia's invasion, where are our emergency spending funds? If the city used one moment, can, can use bonds to fund capital improvement projects and collect property taxes to repay the debt? Why isn't something like this being done to assist NYCHA? In closing, we are looking to you to be meaningful voices that you were hired to be to the many families, citizens, taxpayers, and veterans living in the only affordable housing provided in New York City for low-income New Yorkers. We are counting on each of you to renew our faith in our government. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your testimony. We hear you loud and clear. We'll next hear from Marquise Jenkins, followed by Letitia McNeil and Ronald Topping. Your time Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon, um, Councilwoman Alexa Avilas and all the other council members. And thank you for holding this very critical hearing. Over the last five years, the New York City Housing Authority has transitioned over 15,000 public housing apartments into private management through the rental assistance demonstration and permanently affordable commitment together program. Residents to preserve public housing and public housing residents citywide have been firmly opposed to any privatization based efforts to address funding or living conditions at NYCHA. While the RAD impact program have been held by some as a solution to the budget and repair issues facing NYCHA and public housing communities, there have already been many well documented reports of many issues residents continue to face during and even after RAD pack conversions in their communities. Local journalism from city limit, the city, and reports from the Human Rights Watch have uncovered extensive quality of life concerns for residents in pack converted communities, including skyrocketing, skyrocketing eviction rates, worsening repairs, maintenance issues, and even dire public health concerns such as lead and mold, lacking transparency, communication, and accountability between residents and private property management as well as weakened tenant protections, such as laws of legally stipulated regulation for lead and mold abatement. As a resident-led organization, we have also heard from a number of members facing similar issues in their community, as well as including shabby and uncompleted repair work and dangerous condition for residents living through construction or renovation in their homes through the pandemic. It is also clear that the issues are not unique to pack conversions but instead are symptoms of the for-profit motive embedded in the private market of housing. As several of the largest property managers involved in the PAC program have, in the PAC program also have extensive records of housing violations in their privately owned and publicly subsidized affordable housing builders across the city. It is in this light that we oppose not only the ongoing RAD PAC conversions, but any and all privatization efforts that, imp that empower private interests within public housing, including the newly introduced Public Housing Preservation Trust legislation that would make NYCHA beholden to its creditors before its community. To that end, RPPH is calling on the City Council to redirect $1.2 billion in funds allocated for the PAC program and Mayor Eric Adams' executive budget onto NYCHA's capital and operating budget. Much of the justification for pursuing privatization efforts and PAC programs in particular have relied on the lack of public funding for housing authorities. Yet this administration is earmarking over $1 billion, not for public housing, but for the erosion and privatization of public housing calls that rationale into question. In the midst of rising rents and crisis of affordability and homelessness sweeping across the city, it is counterintuitive and unconscionable to divest from on the only existing program that provides a solution. Truly affordable and permanent housing at scale provided through the New York City Housing Authority. We demand, and I close with this, we demand that $1.2 billion be allocated instead to NYCHA's existing capital budget and that the $59 million, in that $59 million increase the Department of Corrections to add 578 new officers is instead allocated to conducting an independent audit and increasing the size of the Capital Projects Division at NYCHA. We applaud the City Council's recent call for the $400 billion investment into affordable and supportive housing, but without the, consum without the investment into public housing at NYCHA, these efforts will amount to little more than half measure. Instead, we call on the council to meet the moment of the city's housing crisis with a total of $2.5 billion in investment into NYCHA's both capital repairs and operating costs. Finally, alongside our call to privatize NYCHA's, uh, finally, alongside our call to prioritize NYCHA proper within the city's budget, RPPH is also advocating for the implementation of an independent, comprehensive forensic audit of NYCHA's accounting. The pitfalls of privatization and the need for public funding is clear. 
but so is the need for transparency and accountability in NYCHA administration. For far too long, there has been a harmful lack of both transparency and accountability with regards to NYCHA's budget allocation and spending in particular, leading to both concerns of financial mismanagement and well negatively impacted repairs and maintenance work. In addition, public housing tenants and resident leadership have too often been on the outskirts of NYCHA's budget management and decision making. RPPH is urging the City Council to support the creation of an annual independent forensic audit of the New York City Housing Authority with specific provisions for resident oversight and decision making. Thank you so much for my time to speak. I will submit my written testimony. Thank you so much, Mr. Jenkins. We appreciate you. We'll now hear from Letitia McNeil, followed by Ronald Topping. Your time will begin. You're still muted. Um, hi, good evening. Um, if you can hear me, um, I'm sorry I can't go into detail of all of my concerns with the RAD impact um, program. Um, I just have a lot of concerns about it. Um, I've heard a little, I got a little bit of um, information from what was said prior to me coming on. I'm in the midst of picking on my children, but I still have a lot of concerns about it and what it's going to do for NYCHA in the future and um, other things that I'm concerned about. I will present, I will um, submit some things in writing, but right now I cannot speak. I'm, I've been on this call and I'm picking on my children, but I do still have concerns about the program. Thank you so much, Ms. McNeil. We look forward to hearing your testimony or reading it. Next, we'll hear from Ronald Topping, followed by Lakeisha Taylor. Yes, DC Grace, good evening, everyone. We waited a long time just to get some testimony in. And um, some of the testimony, I hope you all were not on your phones, ear texting, or you were actually paying attention to the residents, because oftentimes people don't listen to us. They do what they want, make decisions for us, and don't even live in our community. We oppose the RAD. We oppose the PAC. We oppose even your trust because we don't trust you, and we don't, we, we're not in for, for any of that sort of stuff. We want to have a forensic audit done because um, the controller, Scott Springer, former controller, did one. So when we talk about looking for money streams, there is money out there. It's that they don't want it. They don't want to use it for us because you have black and brown communities living in public housing along with Asians and Hispanics, et cetera. The problem is you got $400 million sitting down at Battery Park. Why isn't anybody or getting the mayor or having lunch with him, asking him to sign off on that money to be released to help public housing? Why don't we re-earmark the lottery system that takes in money that build schools, that schools are now consolidated, and then put us on one side of the highway than the other versus the other people? The moment we graduate and get out of out of those areas, here you are telling us that we can't get a bank loan. So why don't we start cutting off the damn bank for loaning the developers money who's trying to displace us? RAD is supposed to be a demonstration, but what it really means is real advanced displacement is what it is. So we can read between the lines. PAC is nothing more. They say permanent affordable commitment together. There's nothing permanent. There's nothing affordable. There is no true commitment and there's nothing together. So we oppose that. Those programs are government programs where they want you to do what government says to much is given, much is expected, but they do not realize that there are money streams out there that can be tapped in to help public housing. The Reagan administration put us in this damn hole, took public housing money, and reverted it over to transportation with the HUD secretary, Samuel Pierce. Why is it somebody reviewing that to find out where the hell that money is? So don't tell us that you can't do something and say, to, oh, they're not going to give you any more money. We demand that you give you more money because we built this country off the back of our ancestors. And without us, you would not be where we are today. Why not preserve public housing as it see fit? We're talking about the ventilation systems because we don't have a decent one in, in the development. That's why you're going to get the mold. That should be corrected. We need to pay attention to what is being said. 
And I will close with this. Where there is no justice, there will be no peace. We oppose RAC, PAC, the Blue Plan, et cetera. And Mr. Mr. Our Chairperson, who stands to gain the most out of this with pills and tally, we don't want that development company here in New York. Way for us is no damn good as well. So let's get rid of them. Let's find some funding and fix up these buildings. Not cosmetic surgery, but let's do the structural surgery for these people. I'm done. Thank you. Um, we'll hear from one additional uh, witness who is joining us via Zoom, and then we have a few members of the public that are present in person. <clears throat> so while she is testifying, I'm going to ask them to come up to the witness table so that we can be ready to take your testimony afterwards. Uh, the members of the public that are present in person are Sean Campion, Elizabeth Giori, and Raphael Mopunit. And now we'll hear via Zoom from Lakeisha Taylor. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Lakeisha Taylor. Um, I live at Holmes Towers on the Upper East Side. I appreciate you for giving me this time. Um, I, my plan was also to be there in public, but as we know, things happen in your home. Um, recently, my home was vandalized um, by a third party um, vendor. To hear about RAD and PAC and to understand that NYCHA is giving up our homes to third party vendors is just disheartening. Because again, it's showing how NYCHA is just giving up their, their power to people who are not as not trustworthy. And again, the, the resident is going to have to fight for, for their rights. A lot of this stuff has already been hurt, said. We need an auditor. We need to look at NYCHA's books because we know that NYCHA cannot be trusted. I had to basically pound NYCHA to give me cash money for all of the things that were stolen out of my house. We can, they put up these pretty little pictures about people who are happy. And sure, there, there is going to be a percentage of people who are happy, but there's still a percentage, a large percentage of people who are suffering the same under NYCHA as they, that are going, that are suffering when we, when they enter to these PAC and RAD uh, development deals. And that is sad because you're here trying to say, look at what we're going to do, look at what we have learned, and look at what's happening. The truth of the matter is we need money, we need dollars, and we know we have known this from a long time ago. And we have to make sure that these dollars that we are supposed to get are going to the right place. It is sad that people have lived here for generations and we have we're going to suffer more. You understand? Our buildings are crumbling and you're just going into deals with with snakes and 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 lizards. You understand? And that's 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 a, it's a it's a false promise that NYCHA is selling yet again. And we have to learn from our mistakes. We have to learn from our mistakes and make sure that we're not going to put the vulnerable people who have worked hard for what they have in the same predicament by saying that these developers or these deals are going to be better. And we know that it's not. If NYCHA does not open up their books and truly show us what they're doing with these dollars, you're truly putting people in, in, a, in, a, in a bad predicament. And we, we, you have to learn from the mistakes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll hear from the panelists who are present, um, starting with Sean Campion, followed by Elizabeth Yori and Raphael Mopunit. Your time will begin. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Campion. I'm a senior research associate at the Citizens Budget Commission. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank and watchdog dedicated to constructive change in the services, finances, and policies of New York City and New York State governments. Um, our, our testimony is available online, so I want to highlight a few things um, that we uh, speak about in our longer testimony. Um, we really want to note four points that we raised about RAD Impact. Um, first is that RAD is working. Um, converting from federal Section 9 public housing funding to more stable and flexible funding under Section 8 through RAD Impact has allowed NYCHA to raise funds for comprehensive modernization projects across the city, as we've heard about today. Um, over $3 billion to renovate more than 15,000 units with another 20,000 in the pipeline. 
Um, that's more than halfway towards NYCHA's goal of converting 62,000 units under RAD. Um, and these investments have and will continue to dramatically improve the quality of life uh, for tens of thousands of residents in these developments. Um, second is that the implementation has protected residents and actually improved quality of life. Um, as a member of the Fulton uh, Chelsea Working Group and co-chair of their um, subcommittee on capital investment, you know, I can speak to sort of uh, how the PAC program preserves residents' rights and protections and affordability rules, um, and also how now residents have a seat at the table in the design and the developer selection uh, process for RAD conversions that they didn't before. Third, however, is that RAD alone is not enough. It's only covering 62,000 units under RAD, which leaves another 110,000 units without funding for repairs and improved property management. Um, and conditions continue to deteriorate faster than NYCHA's ability to fix them under the uh, Section 9 program, even with record levels of city and state capital support. Um, and fourth is that the proposed preservation trust is the best hope for preserving those 110,000 units not currently in the RAD pipeline. Um, just to note finally that you know, time is not on NYCHA's side. When we first analyzed NYCHA's capital needs in 2018, we found that 90% of the units were at risk of deteriorating past the point of fixing them um, by 2027. Um, and the currently undergoing physical needs assessment will determine whether the duration continues, but clearly the only path to stable our operations um, and improve conditions is a combination of RAD Pact and the Preservation Trust. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Yori. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Vilas, members of the Public Housing Committee. Um, and members of the public. My name is Elizabeth Giori. I'm a Skadden Fellow and Staff Attorney in the Citywide Tenants' Rights Coalition, a Legal Services NYC. Lisney is the largest civil services provider in the nation and has a history of um, representing tenants living in NYCHA. As a Skadden Fellow, my project seeks to mitigate the rights of NYCHA tenants, um, including those facing privatization of their units under RAD or NYCHA's Blueprint for Change, including through direct representation, affirmative litigation, and policy advocacy. As we've heard today, there's an overwhelming need for the City Council to take steps to ensure that public housing tenants can live with dignity in their own homes and have their rights fully protected. I'd like to thank the committee for taking, um, prioritizing this critical issue, and we'll move on to the main points of my commentary. In addition to my January 13, 2021 <coughs> testimony, which raised um, concerns about risk of evictions, lack of repairs in RAD PAC buildings, as well as tenant mistrust, we have three other main areas of concern about PAC RAD. The first is the inadequacy of NYCHA's RAD PAC transfer procedures, especially for those um, disabled tenants or tenants who are the victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. The second is the lack of oversight and accountability relating to the construction work and its quality in the long term. And the third is the lack of transparency and enforcement of tenants' rights, especially in the con context of grievance rights. Um, with remaining time, I'll speak briefly about these issues in turn, and um, my main commentary is, is written. Um, in terms of the inadequacy of transfer procedures, we've been told that after a building converts to RAD Pact, tenants can no longer transfer across the entire portfolio. Instead, NYCHA has said that they will simply issue a tenant-based voucher to be used on the private market. Um, this raises three major concerns. The first is that refusing tenants to transfer across the portfolio um, to another geographic area um, may violate anti-discrimination laws, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of disability. The second is that NYCHA's transfer policy in RAD Pact amounts to a diminishment of tenants' rights that they had after conversion um, in direct contravention of the RAD statute and NYCHA's representation to tenants. And third, the provision of a portable voucher for tenants to use on the private market often fails to address tenants' needs in a housing market replete with source of income discrimination and rent inflation. I understand that my time has expired, so I will just say that, um, that we have a lot of concerns in terms of the construction oversight, um, lack of communications about the schedule of repairs, safety and health concerns with the way that the work is being carried out, elevator allergies, um, outages, um, sometimes this leads to um, holdovers um, for, for refusal to provide access. Um, and, and finally, in terms of transparency and enforcement rights, I will say that we would like for there to be um, the transactional documents to be publicly disclosed, along with the financing documents, um, and more um, protections in terms of grievance rights, because tenants have not been able to fully assert their grievance rights, especially for remaining family member um, grievances. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Rafael Mopanet. And for those that are joining via Zoom, we'll follow with Lucy Newman, followed by Stan Morse. Oh, um. 
Good afternoon, Chair Villas, and thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Rafael More Panet. I am uh, the Associate Director for Housing Programming at the Harlem Community Justice Center, which is a project of the Center for Court Innovation. Um, we have 20 years working with Harlem residents on housing issues, specifically working with NYCHA residents and now working with PAC residents um, for the PAC developments in the Manhattan Bundle, which are in, in Harlem. Um, first, I want to speak about New York City marshal data on evictions in, in packed buildings. Um, I've done an analysis of the first six packed conversions. So the first six in the timeline, about half of the total portfolio. Um, and I found 394 warrants for eviction were issued in those buildings post-conversion. And 110 of those warrants were executed by the marshals. Um, this were all focused in the two developments that are being managed by Wavecrest Management. Ocean Bay and Bettens' houses. Um, Ocean Bay had a tenfold increase in eviction warrants after conversion and a sixfold increase in eviction warrants execution post conversion, and Bettens' had a threefold increase in uh, eviction warrant execution post conversion. Which begs the question what oversight is NYCHA doing over Wavecrest management if all of the evictions post conversion are being done by only one of the management companies selected and packed? which I think is a, a question we would like to know the answer to, and a concern for the future um, developments that are selected to work with this management company um, in, in future conversions. Um, the next thing I want to, and I want to echo part of what um, Liz Jory said in her, in her testimony about grievances. Um, you know, NYCHA was accused of widespread and systematic rent overcharging in the fields of ERAS settlement, and settled that case which took effect this year, and put in new protections for tenants who are challenging rent overcharge. Basically, they lose their income, the subsidy doesn't adjust to their loss of income, they're sued for non-payment in housing court, and then NYCHA tells them, go get a one-shot deal, and they get a loan from the city for the rent that they owe, and then they, get a, and then they pay it off. And this is the system that NYCHA has historically used instead of accurately adjusting subsidies to tenant income, right? And we are seeing this is continuing in the packed developments, Pack developments are not protected under Fields v. Rust because it's a new ownership model. And the nonprofit providers are perpetuating this issue in these developments. We have some preliminary evidence of this in Bettens' houses and in Twin Parks West that the nonprofit provider meets with tenants that owe rent and says to them, you should get a one-shot deal, which is a loan from the city for rent arrears that they may not actually owe. And if they were simply just to be able to file a grievance, which we now understand has been complicated because there are two different ways the grievance can go, um, that would resolve their rent arrears. My agency specializes in this. We've helped residents collect more than $100,000 in, in money back by doing grievances against the housing authority. And we're very much concerned that the new nonprofit services on site are just gonna have people take out loans for money they don't actually owe, and now it's gonna be the new system under PACT. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you so much. Um, I, I I have several questions, but I wanted to ask if you could expand a little bit on, on some of the work around, uh, around disabled tenants and the transfer process. Yes, so um, we've been told by NYCHA that they will not transfer a tenant from one RAD building to another RAD building unless it is the same private landlord and management company. And so they have to be in the same bundle when they convert, or they're saying they will not transfer them to, for example, from Ocean Bay to uh, Twin Parks West. That, that is not possible. They also have said that they will not transfer tenants from uh, Project Based Section 8 to public housing, even in the instance in which somebody needs an accessible apartment. Um, I, I recently did an intake with a tenant who is living in a one-bedroom apartment with his disabled brother, and he has to live in the, uh, sleep in the bedroom um, and actually can't do physical therapy related to his disabilities. And he was actually on a public housing wait list, and that was actually canceled. He was taken off the wait list at the time of conversion, despite having been on that wait list, as he tells me, um, for six or seven years. And so this is a, a real issue for tenants who are disabled, who need to be transferred to accessible departments, apartments, but also for tenants who um, may have suffered some sort of a traumatic incident, domestic violence, stalking, a crime, um, and, and need to leave the area, and, and they can't do that right now under this procedure, which we believe is actually in violation of anti-discrimination law and is a diminishment of tenants' rights, um, which is not allowed under the RAD statute, and is also just not something that NYCHA represents to tenants um, when they talk about the RAD PAC program and tell tenants, you'll preserve all of your rights, but this fundamental right is not being preserved. Thank you so much for that. We, we absolutely need to follow up on this line of questioning because this is, this is a critical area that I think when we look at um, 
impact resident protections. None of those are listed or protected classes or what to do in the advent of these these requirements. So I think it's something we have to drill down on. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of the um, Actually, I, th I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We will now hear from Lucy Newman, followed by Stan Morse and Victor Bach. Hi, can you hear me? Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Lucy Newman. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Ch Chair Aviles for her leadership. Uh, and commitment to public housing residents, especially those who have undergone a packed conversion. Um, at Legal Aid, uh, similarly with uh, other colleagues who have testified uh, before me, I think we've always believed that it's important to be at the table uh, representing our clients who live throughout the five boroughs of New York City in uh, NYCHA's public housing stock to ensure that when facing a RAD conversion, which I'm going to now refer to as PACT because other than Ocean Bay, every one of them has been a PACT conversion, um, that their rights are protected to the fullest extent possible and the issues that are arising we're able to see and then help advocate for uh, our clients and try and make changes to uh, the, the program that is um, you know, rolling out and rolling out in the, in the future uh, to an even greater extent. Um, we have established a helpline that has been mentioned before, um, which uh, we help um, residents who are both pre- and post-packed conversion. They can call our helpline and talk to um, either paralegals who are uh, staffing that helpline or, or attorneys in our housing units to talk about issues that they're facing, again, pre- or post-conversion. Um, the good thing about this is that obviously we're, we're seeing a lot of calls coming in, we're getting information about some of the things that people are, are facing, and we are meeting regularly with NYCHA to dr address many of the issues that we're seeing, but again, it's obviously a work in pro progress. I would just say that before conversion, there is a huge amount of kind of housekeeping matters that really do need to be addressed to help ensure that residents post-conversion um, are not being given the runaround on a lot of issues that impact tenants. Uh, and then subsequently Section 8 participants. So for example, what we see a lot of is people calling around, uh, adding household members, rent recertifications, whether that's an interim recertification because of a, a change in income or a, an annual recertification, transfers, reasonable accommodations, succession claims, which are also known as remaining family member claims, and uh, language access issues. So we do see a lot of um, residents being kind of bounced around between NYCHA and the development teams, and that's something that is obviously a, a huge concern to us because we know that residents ultimately are the, are the individuals that bear the brunt of that. So what we would recommend, and I, this will be in our written testimony that we'll upload later, is a, a transition team on the ground at a much earlier stage that involves both the leased housing department and the public housing units and the development team so that they can start working together, not simply on the day of conversion, but way before that. Um, we also would like um, that when there's, we would like obviously for a much more resident-led process. Um, that being said, there was a report that NYCHA did on the NYCHA resident survey in 2021, which had a finding that 74% of the people interviewed for that didn't actually vote for their resident association, and many of them didn't even know that they had a resident association. So I think it's very important to expand the residents um, that are able to participate in that. Uh, again, I wanted to just reiterate that with many other people that given the fact that Build Back Better looks like it's dead in the water and the promise of $40 billion for capital needs has evaporated, uh, we would support um, the legislation that's in Albany uh, right now for the creation of a preservation or public trust um, and really urge that it be passed this session given just how dire uh, the situation is for NYCHA. They've added recently opt-in language into that legislation that would require a resident vote at the development, so residents would have the choice about whether or not to go forward with that trust. But we would really urge um, Albany to pass that legislation. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Stan Morse, followed by Victor Bach and Brendan Cheney. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stan Morse. I am the co-founder of the One Night to Podcast as well as a community organizer for the Justice for All Coalition. I was at the Wise Towers um, 
early conversion when, when you guys first started that. And the residents did not want it. It was pushed through anyway. I was at Linden Houses doing those early meetings when, when, uh, when I was being brought to that. They didn't want it. And it was pushed through anyway. Um, I got a, 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 a actual footage from my colleague, San, Sandrea Coleman, of somebody living in, 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 in Boulevard houses. You know, it is in horrible conditions. You know, so, and she's calling people like us because she can't get in touch with nobody in management. She can't get no answers from anyone. We're going to send that video to Chairman Russ, you know, later on, if not today, but tomorrow, and we'll see what happens. But if she's going to do that and can't get no services, no help, no nothing, and I mean, her apartment is horrendous, she cannot be the only one. You know, so to have folks sit here and say that, you know, there's some oversight and there's really things being done, that's far from the case. I've heard from people from Ocean Bay, same issue. We terrible repair issues. The mold is back. The lead paint's back. All the same problems they face under NYCHA is coming back. We just did a slap job, and, th and it's all coming back in the same way, worse in some cases. You know, so to think that there's any oversight, to think that there's any improvement for these residents being converted in, in, into bad, it's absurd. So when we, when we show this footage, it will speak for itself. More than any words anybody from NYCHA can ever say, it's horrendous. And, it, and if that's one person, you best believe there's a whole, whole lot more living in conditions like that in these buildings that have been converted that nobody hears from and nobody knows. And as a community organizer, I'm telling you, the large majority of NYCHA residents do not know about that hat or the blueprint. And the ones that do know don't want it. You know, and why would we put some down people's dope in the middle of a pandemic when people can't even organize? It's outrageous. You know, this should be paused. This should be put on hold. Other things should be happening. Residents should be given the right to manage their own developments, which cannot happen if there's a private manager company there in their place. It should be stopped completely. Thank you. We will now hear from Victor Bach, followed by Brendan Cheney and Joshua Barnett. Time will begin. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Vic Bach, uh, Housing Policy Analyst with the Community Service Society. Uh, what I'd like to do with a few minutes is uh, put RAD in a broader context. Right now, residents and NYCHA have very few options. It's either RAD or wait for a significant direct government investment in public housing. And the prospects for the uh, for direct government investment are very dim at the moment, and I'm not sure they'll uh, lighten up at any point in the near future. So uh, residents in NYCHA are really left with uh, a Hobson's choice. It's either RAD or um, just uh, wait, wait for uh, Washington or another level of government to come to the rescue eventually. Um, that's why I think uh, I urge the uh, committee to focus its attention on the Preservation Trust, uh, a proposal that is now being considered in Albany in this legislative session. Uh, what the trust does is it adds uh, a third option, a public option, one that's uh, uh, publicly funded, one that keeps uh, public housing and the developments that are converted in public hands, and uh, it's it's a uh, it's a concept, a model that has the potential to generate the full forty billion dollar uh, dollars that NYCHA needs to address its capital backlog. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, the legislation as it stands uh, maintains it retains all of the resident rights and protections that residents now enjoy under Section 9 public housing. And uh, most importantly, it has a provision called a resident option, which provides, uh, which requires uh, residents to uh, support the conversion, uh, uh, either that or the conversion will not move forward. That's an unprecedented measure that gives uh, residents enormous leverage in deciding on whether or not they want to convert. Um, uh, uh, I would urge the committee to focus its attention on the current legislation by drafting a resolution, a council resolution, 
in support of the preser preservation trust. It will only add options for residents rather than take anything away. And uh, I believe it's an, it has enormous potential. So I urge the committee to draft a council resolution that gets to Albany in support of the trust. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Brendan Cheney, followed by Joshua Barnett and Kristen Hackett. Time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Brendan Cheney. I'm the Director of Policy and Communications at the New York Housing Conference. I would like to thank uh, Committee Chair Aviles and the other members of the Public Housing Committee for holding this hearing. Like so many others, we are extremely concerned about conditions at the New York City Housing Authority, including mold, lead paint, leaks, and inconsistent elevators and heat and hot water. Every year we get closer to a day when repairing NYCHA units becomes too costly. And if we lose even one unit of public housing, it will worsen our housing crisis. While funding to maintain public housing should be the responsibility of the federal government, it is unlikely that we will see significant federal capital funding from Washington. Currently, the federal government allocates only $500 million per year for capital funding for NYCHA, which needs $40 billion for repairs, grossly insufficient to meet the need. And while there was a brief window of hope last year that Congress might come to the rescue and we were leading efforts here to support Build Back Better, it is now stalled and federal housing funding is very unlikely. Um, we at the New York Housing Conference have called on the city and state to provide 1.5 billion per year each for NYCHA's capital repairs. Unfortunately, neither Governor Hochul nor Mayor Adams have agreed to this level of support. We will keep pushing for the city and state to step up. But absent federal funding, absent city and state funding, uh, the Permanent Affordability Commitment Together Program, utilizing the Federal Re Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, has proven to be a necessary and effective way to preserve public housing. Through the PACT program, NYCHA has successfully partnered with affordable housing developers to implement building systems replacement and apartment upgrades that should have been done decades ago. This program has produced results that are impressive, including modernizing antiquated and unreliable heating systems, sealing the building envelopes, refreshing common spaces, and often updating kitchens, bathrooms, and windows in residents' apartments. NYCHA has also made great strides in improving outreach and opportunities for residents to contribute to the scope of work for repairs and developer selection, and we hope that they will build on this progress in the Adams administration. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Joshua Barnett, followed by Kristen Hackett, and then Janine. Time will begin. Okay. Hi. Um, want to, again, like everybody else, want to very much thank Councilmember Avilas for holding this hearing and being a leader on public housing. Um, my name is Josh Barnett. I'm a union representative in Local 375, DC 37 AFSME, and since 1999, I've been a full-time employee in NYCHA as an architect in um, the Design Department and Capital Projects Division. And I'm here to oppose any privatization of public housing standing with the residents in that both on the red and the blue print. Um, and I don't say that lightly. You know, we know that the, that the repairs are direly needed. It's what the work myself and my coworkers deal with in capital projects every day, trying to stretch very scarce renovation dollars to the breaking point. But privatization always ends badly in any public service. We've seen it in other things like public transportation and public education and certainly public health. We have no reason to think that public housing is going to be any different. We're really worried that this would set a really bad precedent in terms of developing more public housing. We've heard a lot about preserving public housing, but we're living in a city and a country that's horribly gentrified, dealing with affordable housing crisis, facing a wave of evictions. We need a lot more public housing. And once we start going down the route of relying on the free market, we know we're never going to see anything more but luxury market rate housing that's going to only exacerbate poor, uh, poor conditions and homelessness. Um, we're also worried that the workers' voice really hasn't been heard. You know, we're as out of the loop as a lot of the residents feel in terms of development of how this affects hiring. Um, we see a real potential for union busting um, and a reduction of wages and job security and benefits, which we really don't want to see now that workers are really being burdened by inflation, health care, and housing costs. Um, and we don't see any guarantees in red or the blueprint, by the way, that all new hires will be civil service, will be union, will have the same kind of benefits and wages and job protections that the unions really try, try and fight for. When we say that RAD is the only public um, housing stream, that reflects a lack of political will because we know the money is there. If we tax Wall Street, if we tax 
through which if we have mandatory linkage between, between luxury development and affordable housing. Um, so just in short, we really want to say that everybody needs to see at the table, including the workers. We've lost 25% of our workers, 50% of the people in my department since I started in 99. We need, need an over, oversight, um, like people said, a forensic audit, an immediate RAD moratorium. Um, and for the sake of everybody and the city, we need more public housing than we need to keep it public. We'll submit written testimony as well. Thank you. We will now hear from Kristen Hackett, followed by Janine. Time will begin. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you for your time today. And thanks to Madam Chair for hosting this hearing. Uh, my name is Kristen Hackett. I'm a PhD student at CUNY studying the plans for public housing. Um, and I organize with neighbors living in public housing uh, with the Justice for All Coalition, Save Section 9, and Neighbors Helping Neighbors in the Rockaways. So there's a few points I wanted to share today. So first, RAD has been an absolute policy failure. Uh, this is clear in many of the individual testimonies that have been given today, as well as in the growing body of research. The research from the National Housing Law Project um, and Human Rights Watch are most clear, highlighting how RAD leads to tenants, uh, tenants' rights abuses and even evictions. But even studies that support uh, RAD as a program from enterprise community partners and even the Citizens Housing and Planning Council report mentioned already in this hearing, while they reflect positively on the program, they also uh, find increases in evictions and tenant turnovers. They just gloss over those findings. You know, and it's also clear in general and from this hearing that most policy analysts and researchers pushing RAD impact in the blueprint are willing to ignore these issues. And it's also clear on this call that residents are not, and they're having to speak out over and over and over again about these abuses. Um, Second, elected officials so far have not done enough. Uh, tenants have been ringing the alarm on RAD for years now. And for the most part, elected officials have stood idly by or even endorsed the program. For example, when Fulton House's residents opposed RAD conversion for over a year and collected signatures from 75% of neighbors, local elected officials convened that working group that's been discussed already on this call. And eventually, then that working group actually worked to lock tenants out of the decision-making process. They published an op-ed about how that went down. So people who are lauding that as this amazing positive example are lying about what actually happened there. Um, another good example is in 2019 when City Limits released a study showing the extremely high rate of evictions at Ocean Bay houses. Um, not one public official made a public comment, let alone took up any official investigation. Time is expired. Same is true filing the groundbreaking report from Human Rights Watch. In the, uh, and in the absence of official investigations, tenants in the Rockaways are now taking it upon themselves to survey neighbors at Ocean Bay Houses. And already we've seen the results of that survey, and it's not good. Um, so when are elected officials who represent these tenants going to come forward and stand with them rather than continuing to work against them and their interests? Third and finally, it's equally important to note that as bad as RAD is, the Blueprint presents tenants with no better options. Both RAD and the Blueprint are attempts to undermine the robust federal rights imbued to public housing residents by transferring all units of public housing in New York City to project-based Section 8 and to end public housing as an institution in New York City. This would be a travesty for our city and would undoubtedly spur privatization nationally, which would drive homelessness and housing insecurity for low-income and fixed-income and working-class households. Equally so, this would constitute a another significant racialized dispossession provoked by ongoing disinvestment in black and brown communities and lives, uh, continuing harmful and violent historic trends. Uh, the only option is to ramp up pressure on the federal government to restore and expand Section 9 housing here in New York City and nationally. And this is what the majority of tenants uh, on this call have called for, and that should be respected. In short, New York City is at a crossroads. Rather than perpetuating harm, I encourage us to choose to oppose RAD and privatization wholesale and lead a national movement to truly address the housing crisis we're facing here in the, our city and across the country. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Janine, followed by Kimberly Combs. And if there is anyone else who is still on Zoom that we have inadvertently missed, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you at the end. Time will begin. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Janine, and I am an Ocean Bay RAD resident. Um, I've listened to what you guys were saying. A lot of the things are untrue. Here, they just put a Band-Aid on everything. 
the people, a lot of families have been displaced. They're seniors now on pantry lines because they cannot afford the rent. And it is shameful. And it is shame on you. And I know people that had was asking for transfers, that had domestic violence issues that are still forced and they're stuck here. There's no one that they can go to to help them. And, and it's sad. I want to know why, since we converted to RAD, we are now filling out lease every six months, which makes no sense. Why people's rent are going up every so often. I know because I was one of those tenants that it was happening to, too. You can complain. We have no one to help us. Who are we to go to? We're in here. You put you you made it look nice. Granted, why are there locks on the staircase? Now, if me as a resident, I have a key tag to get in my building. I can only get off if I had to walk up to another floor. I can't even use my key tag to get off on another floor. One of my prisoner in my own home. Why why are we being treated like this? Stop with the lies, acting like RAD is great. RAD is not great. RAD has a lot of families displaced, and it's shameful that this is going on. We've tried to contact Bill de Blasio when he was in office, when he did all of this, when he was even out here speaking. I was trying to tell him, we were, tennis was telling him that this was, this was a facade that they were putting on, trying to act like this program was so good. Please help them people, because like I said, I see a lot of families that are no longer here. And it needs to be stopped. Management, they're getting better now because they got a little bit of time is expired. And they know what they're doing, but it's still not right. <laughs> I'm done. Thanks very much. We will now hear from Kimberly Combs. Time will begin. Oh, God. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon. Go ahead, we hear you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Combs from Red Fern Houses in Far Rockaway, Queens. And um, well, I, I agree with the last resident from Ocean Bay because I was a part of the group that did the survey. And there were many that were just in dis discomfort, I would say, with the new way with Brad. So I don't totally agree with Brad. Yes, it is beautiful to the eye, but there were still residents who had complaints with repairs, leaking, and different things of that nature. And as I've learned that, Redfern is supposed to be also um, under, you know, beginning, the beginning stages of RAD. I would hope that all the residents in Redfern would be able to somewhat sit at the table with decision making if that was the case. And um, I'm out and about, I, I guess you can see, so I really wasn't prepared to really speak, but like I said, I do agree with uh, a few of the residents that got on and spoke, and they I don't agree with Rad. If families will be displaced, and um, you know, it, 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 it like I said, it, it's beautiful to the eye, but not all the residents are happy, and there is somewhat of a uh, system. How you say systemic racism going on? So. Um, all the officials and um, everyone who will be involved in doing this, Brad, need to speak to residents and get their ideas and maybe even some solutions. Thank you again. This is Kimberly Combs of Red Fern Houses, Far Rockaway, Queens. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, this concludes the public testimony portion of this hearing. I will now turn it back over to the chair to close. So again, first and foremost, um, extend my thanks and gratitude for the generosity of the residents who have both testified here on Zoom and in person, but who have been actively engaged in their developments and fighting, um, and quite frankly, um, 
surviving severely substandard conditions on a daily basis that should have never happened to begin with. Um, so next, I also want to thank uh, the NYCHA staff, uh, who is duly noted, remained during the entire hearing, which is highly unusual, but absolutely appreciated, and I hope a sign of what is to come around the importance of hearing the residents and really taking into account what is being said um, in testimony. I guess what we have seen today and certainly um, what you all have experienced, right, is um, a tale of many cities um, and many different experiences. I will say for the record that I am still mystified um, by the slides and the reality that are painted by so many different residents around what they are experiencing under conversion. I will absolutely admit that there are residents who have been happy with their conversion. But far greater have I heard a number of uh, deep concerns around the program and its implementation and calls for a holding of the program, a not full moratorium, but some are calling for moratorium, but a holding for a program that to date has received an enormous amount of public subsidy, private investment, and yet we have no real assessment um, of, of both what it yields along multiple dimensions besides, you know, ass, um, assessments of capital repairs, evaluation of capital repairs, and, and what they potentially look like on the market, but no real assessment. So um, I would like to see NYCHA do a full assessment of the RAD impact conversion in addition to the survey and getting resident feedback, which is obviously critical, but that is in and of itself not um, a full assessment. I think here we heard today that we're going to be expecting NYCHA to respond to a number of questions, which I will not capture all here because there were a good number of them, but certainly we want to know the total public dollars that have been invested um, in PACT. We want to hear follow-up on these transfer procedures that we have heard. Um, that are particularly uh, detrimental to um, residents with disabilities and others facing crisis. Uh, it is absolutely unacceptable that we would allow this to continue. So we look forward to hearing what are the standard, uh, what are the procedures, and how can we ensure protections for residents, whether RAD or, RAD or PACT, I assume it's all under HUD. These are New York City residents, and they demand full protection. We want to hear more about the reasonable accommodations, policy, and procedures that are made around language access uh, plan, around the documentation for developer fees and the financing. I will be expecting more of that reporting back. Reporting on the monitoring activity and obviously the unit that was created, we would like to see what the plans are, what it has yielded. You've heard questions around Wavecrest in particular um, on the, in those, but we know Wavecrest holds others. Um, and so we want to really understand what is the monitoring, what does it look like based on the criteria. Um, we'd also like to know more about the reporting uh, of selection of sites and the rubric that is used and how sites are moved up and down that so that residents and also elected officials and other stakeholders have some sensibility around why you developments are selected and how they fall in a process of selection. Um, we're asking for further information on section three. Uh, we, NYCHA did provide um, some numbers, uh, 125 uh, or maybe not that exact number, but a roundabout amount, but we would like more information on really what the types of jobs that we're talking about, also retention, um, and real labor impacts um, of Section 3. Are these union work? Um, we are a union town, and of course, we'd like to see more union effort. Um, you're hearing from the residents that there is still a real gulf um, in 
the consistent and understanding around policies and procedures with these various entities, from HUD to NYCHA to private management. Um, there are still many areas that we need to be have clear information in multiple languages because it is still very much falling through the cracks. And the result of that is displacement, it's continued distrust with NYCHA, and all the other governmental en entities. If we, if we put a value of the cost on that practice, on us not thinking through systematically and ensuring that we do no harm, we are in a perpetual cycle of not only wasting taxpayer dollars, but creating systems that in, it, in and of itself will be ineffective because people do not trust in those systems. And so I implore um, my colleagues to continue on these processes. I know there have been a good number of programs that have been developed around improving resident engagement and the process and what that looks like. Um, and I am happy to see those and I hope that the facts on the ground will begin to reflect what these programs are and their, um, their purpose. As of yet, the facts on the ground do not reflect that. They reflect very much NYCHA of old, which is, I don't know what's happening here. No one has been in touch, or I've called and I get a roundabout circle. So of many, many questions around RAD Impact, again, I will just say, um, we spent this hearing looking and trying to understand jurisdictional issues, financing, monitoring, oversight, um, te tenant protections and how they fare under RAD Impact. Um, I'm, I'm deeply disheartened that this administration has decided it would much rather commit 1.2 billion to RAD Impact and not have a full-throated investment in budget uh, for the crisis that still 110,000 additional residents are facing um, across developments in New York City. I think we need to, particularly when there is no assessment of this program um, and no clear data. Um, I guess, Lastly, I will cl close by saying um, our duty is to the residents who are New York City residents that we make sure we leverage all of our investments, all of our resources to ensure that they have safe and dignified housing. I do believe public housing is an incredible New York City asset. It is the asset that has ensured that this city remains diverse and that low-income people can live here, which we see as an increasing crisis. We must protect public housing. We must ensure that we do right by our public housing residents. So I thank you all for those who are, are, are fighting this fight with us, um, those who will hold and ensure we're speaking truth to power and that the agencies and all the other agencies are, uh, in, are ensuring that there is accountability. And so thank you all for your time, for your testimony, for your work, uh, more to come. And we look forward to the reams of paper and information that we are gonna get from NYCHA regarding all these questions and processes and next steps. So thank you. Was that, oh, I got the gavel.